I completely forgot, my wife reminded me, all the mountains in Norway, plenty of those. <laughs> okay, I actually have uh, uh, three hours. Uh, we're going to take breaks every uh, hour for 10 minutes uh, on two occasions, stop in three hours. Um, I can hang on a little bit after that to talk with anybody if you want to. Um, uh, but I have uh, 100 slides. So it's going to go at a rate of one slide a minute. My wife just joined me. I, 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 so I say hello. <laughs> hello. Okay. That's my uh, wife who I met in London when I was 17. Nice, nice people. Hello. No, hello. <laughs> Say hello, Soi. Hello. hello back. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Um, okay. Now, let's see. There we go. I push, let's see, just checking. Yeah, okay. Okay, so here are the three themes, very roughly divided into three. I, I hope we will not use one hour on the first one. And we get a lot of time for number two, engineering. And uh, it's a fairly short one at the end called science. So maybe half an hour on number one and three, and maybe two of the hours on engineering. Okay, those are the themes. Okay, so first theme, leadership. Uh, I don't have to introduce you to uh, Elon Musk, I'm sure. Uh, but if you, uh, I've got quite a few uh, references where you can study him, but it is as simple, uh, you, as you know, as uh, Googling Elon Musk and video or SpaceX or something. This is a, a fairly recent, I think, from January this Tom, year. We are seeing yeah. your first slide. I don't know if you are moving on, but we can see, at least I can see only the, the first slide at the moment. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, I can Probably. confirm that. Yeah, there's just first slide. Just, okay, just first slide. Right, resume share button is there. Let's see. There's a, res okay, thank you. Let's see. A leadership. So you, I will stop share and resume share to try to get this going. Um, uh, start share. Desk. Keynote. Hope that helps. And you can see Musk's methods Musk. slide now. Yes. Now, if I go to play and I change the slide, does it change? Uh, no, I, can't, I see still Musk. Same. Okay. I don't see. Okay, so I might have to do this. Uh, um, I've had this problem on a rare occasion, but I've had it. Uh, so I might have to not be in keynote full mode, but go through the, let's see. Uh, uh, so that's stuck. Play. Does, does it change slides now? No, not for me. I oh. think the problem is that you just share this specific screen. And then when you share slides, it goes into a different... Okay. screen and then yeah right let's see desktop price good yeah. okay so uh start, starting back here we're starting on the leadership ideas and uh the the most interesting leader in the world right now uh if, if for anything but not least great technology is elon musk in my opinion and uh, so I'm going to uh, study him. I actually wrote a paper, which is in the, on the last slide, um, an, a, a um, reference to the, his paper called Musk's Methods. And I'm quoting from that. So, um, yeah, but uh, so, so this particular link, it's a two and one half hour interview of Elon Musk walking around the Texas SpaceX facility uh, with an expert on rockets, in fact, an expert on Russian rockets, to be more exact, who he has great respect for. So he is speaking very frankly and technically. Um, and so very interesting uh, three-part interview, if you wish to study um, Musk there. 
So the paper that I'm referring to, where I've tried to collect a lot of information about Musk, is here on this link. And of course, everybody is going to get the slides at the end so they can pick up the links. Um, there will be quite a lot of links, and I hope many of you will take the time to study um, the, the links later. During the, uh, um, during the tour, Musk uh, spelled out, and he's never written this down anywhere that we have a copy of, uh, five principles of what he does. And the, there are these five. We're going to look at them in some detail. He also stressed that it was important to do the five in sequence, that is to do the early ones first, and the later ones later. Although he admitted he had often made the mistake of not doing these in sequence. The most famous one is automating too much at the Tesla 3 production in Fremont, California. And he learned to his, his uh, uh, distress uh, that he needed to do some of these others better first. So, uh, um, uh, by the way, I took uh, the trouble to quote uh, something about uh, Russian space against SpaceX comparison. And uh, Mr. Dmitry uh, Rogozin's uh, invitation to Musk to come and visit him and uh, have tea with him. Thought you might be interested in that. So there, the Russians have a great respect for Musk with good reason. Okay. Uh, notice, not, not respect for NASA, respect for Musk, different animal. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go through every one of these in detail. Uh, uh, so I'll just see. So the first one is about my favorite subject and one of our subjects here, requirements. Okay, requirements engineering. Uh, so we have uh, the idea of uh, simplification try to get rid of unnecessary fat in the design or system, um, even at the risk of getting rid of a little bit too much and then having to pull it back in. And then uh, we have, uh, again, another simplification of the design that is in there and optimization of the design. Um, and then we have the notion once uh, you are working with the system, uh, whether it's production of a car or rocket ship or planning an IT system the, to uh, reduce the cycle time. We'll get back to that later, but uh, go faster and faster and faster to the work. And finally, the idea of automating whatever you can that should be automated. And then sort of a, a number six, the everyone should be a chief engineer, where he's really saying everyone should think of the entire system, not just their specialty and, and things like that. So, um, so my, uh, alt for me, broke for that, our system. Okay. Um, okay, so he, but he expresses this as everyone should be a chief engineer and understand the system at a high level so that they can do better, more balanced optimization. Okay. Uh, now, I like these ideas for a simple reason. They are completely parallel to my own ideas, which are in uh, my book, Competitive Engineering, a free digital copy right here, and also in the references at the back. And Competitive Engineering uh, is really the handbook on my language for systems engineering called Planguage, Planning Language, Planguage. Okay, and it contains really the same things that Musk is talking about and doing. But I would rather talk about Musk doing it than Tom Gilb doing it or something like that. Musk is much more fun to study and talk about today. Now, uh, Musk just threw out his ideas orally, as you can see in that first video, and um, uh, roughly, and uh, I realized he needed an editor. He needed somebody to uh, make clear what he was saying, what he was really saying, what was hidden behind it. So I decided to be his editor. 
uh, whether he knows it or not. Maybe he knows it because I put this up on LinkedIn with a link to Musk, <laughs> but he hasn't told me yet. So here is my translation of the ideas. So um, to focus on really critical requirements and be prepared to learn quickly about even better requirements. So this idea of continuously refining and improving your understanding of requirements, not doing requirements up front, signing them off, and then building the system. That would, after all, be uh, big bang waterfall methods, uh, certainly not agile. So this is key to his agility. I would say Musk is the master of agile as it should be, okay? As it should be. Uh, the second idea is uh, the uh, dynamics of design. So design is not something you do after the requirements and before building the rocket. Design is a continual process. Uh, uh, as Musk says in the interview, no two rocket engines are the same, uh, even though they have, in theory, the same model and the same basic structure because they are continually improving the rocket engines. Um, you can even wonder if uh, uh, no, no two Tesla cars produced on different days are the same. There are 26 production changes every week. Okay, so five changes a day. So no two Tesla cars are uh, probably completely identical that are produced in different days anyway. So very, and I use the word dynamic, uh, and dynamic uh, alludes to or refers to agile. Uh, and then there's uh, dynamic design optimization. It's very clear that uh, Musk is very happy just starting with some design, however non-optimal, however bad, as long as it functions, as long as it allows him to shoot a rocket up and see if it blows up or not. So he's, he's very comfortable with bad designs to begin with, but very early, okay? Today, this week, not in a few years. And then uh, he uh, continuously uh, optimizes the design so it can do remarkable things like land two rockets in parallel on Earth. Uh, I hope you've all seen that on video, and if not, there's the video. <coughs> so the fourth <coughs> principle, is this uh, improving the cycle time. And that, uh, that's done by, he, he charges his teams, he calls them pods, teams of six specialist people working together uh, to do one thing, like design a motor to take uh, for a spaceship, for, for example. And he um, challenges them to improve their own working process every cycle every day, no waiting, no approvals by bureaucracy, just do it, okay? So this is one of the reasons for his exceptionally short cycles and exceptionally fast production processes is that the, uh, the, the workers literally are empowered to redesign their own working uh, process using many means such as more automation, getting feedback and learning and getting rid of stupid requirements. That's the first point up there. The fifth is automation, uh, should be obvious, uh, but not everything can or should be automated. He learned the hard way by automating too much on the Tesla three production process before he learned that there's something called too much automation and some things are best left to human beings. And uh, finally, his sixth point, the one about everybody should be a chief engineer, I've translated as a principle of uh, doing systems engineering. So I, uh, a lot of people talk about software engineering. I believe that since software must reside on hardware and interface with people and data, that software engineering cannot be a pure discipline Software engineering has to be systems engineering. It has to think about the entire system, not just about the logic, the program, and the algorithm. 
And unfortunately, there's too much of this. Uh, we can see it in the agile uh, things like um, uh, Agile Manifesto. It's all about programming and algorithms. It is not about the system. And that's the problem. And that's why it fails uh, uh, so horrendously. Okay, so here is the detail. And I think I would not be able to keep my one minute per slide budget if I did as I should like to do. I should like to now spend one hour just on requirements. Uh, but you will find that one hour in, for example, uh, the rest of the lecture will teach you some of these ideas and the competitive engineering book will teach in, in detail. But just to highlight a little bit, uh, Musk does something I'm quite fanatic on that uh, you, um, whenever you have a requirement, you must have a name of a person who suggested the requirement, not a department, not a group, an individual who can be held accountable. I call this the source specification. And every one of uh, the details in one of my requirements, if you open the detailed window, this is what's called a one-liner, uh, you will find uh, who is the source of the ambition level, who is the source of the scale, who is the source of the status, who is the source of the goal. So that, that detail is, uh, I, I believe very strongly that people should know my name is on it. People will know that I did this. If I do something foolish or lazy, they will know. Therefore, I will do a better job and I will, if necessary, correct my original specification. So that's a very interesting and simple idea. You know, put somebody's name on the specifications. Don't make them anonymous, okay? Um, here's another one I love, that requirements must be justified in terms of expected benefits for specific stakeholders. Another one, requirements must be prioritized in terms of contribution to higher levels of objectives. In other words, do the requirements first that give the most value, okay? Uh, here's another one Musk was very clear on, but it says Musk and EM, and EM it means it's almost direct quotation. Uh, these two are a little bit guild fantasy. Uh, uh, but but uh, it, it is what Musk clearly shows he does. So uh, assume all requirements are wrong, no matter who writes them. Very interesting. And they must survive rigorous tests of clarity, relevance, and cost effectiveness. And I'm a very strong believer in that. And of course, get rid of dumb requirements, which are all over the place of people just spouting them with insufficient justification. Anyway, that's just number one. Number two, about design. But uh, he's, he also basically says that the same with requirements, that they are often stupid, they are often unjustified, uh, they should often be deleted. Uh, so designs must never be required, and you always have to keep on looking for a better design continuously while you're still firing rockets and learn from the rocket that just got fired, learn from the car that just got produced, okay? And uh, this one I already alluded to, to get working systems quickly. In other words, cars that are on the road and rockets that try to get into space and uh, then work from that basis and simplify and optimize, okay? Uh, by the way, I'm not explaining some things here and uh, it would take too much time, but <coughs> what you're looking at is a requirement. This is actually a requirement for United Nations sustainability goals for uh, ending poverty. And I wrote a whole book on it, which you can get for free there. Uh, and I analyzed <coughs> and made the goals clearer. And I did it in Planguage, my planning language. So you were looking at a sample of Planguage. And I'll go into that in more detail. But in simple terms, we have uh, defined a scale of measure. And we've defined a goal or a point on that scale of measure, which is how good we want to be. We're defining the degree of improvement in the future. Okay, So I'll get back to more of that later. But it's all spelled out in the competitive engineering book. 
And we're using a tool, which is an app called Valplan, uh, to, uh, uh, but you can use a Word or uh, a, 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 any kind of text editor for this also. But it's nice to have a specialized app. Uh, the specialized app is taking, uh, in this case, I'm taking uh, various uh, designs and I'm rating uh, the, uh, numerically how good the design is. Remember, that's what Musk said, that the design must serve the interests of the stakeholders and uh, deliver value. So this is value. And then this is cost. So for one design, this is value, this is cost. We can see the costs are very high for these two. The costs are very low for these two compared to the value. So uh, you should do the, uh, do the designs first, deliver, incrementally deliver the designs that first give very high value for very low cost. In other words, very profitable is another way of uh, saying it, but that's what's going on there. And we can automatically compute the sequence of highest value to cost uh, first uh, using on a spreadsheet, for example, or using the app. Uh, here's number three, um, uh, uh, dynamic design optimization. I have an illustration. Uh, th there's a link there to a, a case study. One of my uh, Norwegian clients, a small startup with uh, at the time we met them, 60 people worldwide. And they are using uh, these, uh, my, my language methods, but they, they built a spreadsheet overnight and they sort of have everything on one single spreadsheet. So here are the goals quantified. Uh, this level is how bad they were. Uh, these are all usability goals, different types of them. Uh, details on these kinds of things, the scale of measure is in chapter five of the competitive engineering book. We'll look at that later. Uh, this is the worst case numeric level, a tolerable level, and this is the goal level, okay? Now, this is step nine. They're doing weekly increments at the time, and they uh, are, uh, this is a design, uh, the tag or name of a design. Uh, it is estimated to de deliver 20 minute saving, and they decided to target uh, this fellow here, they wanted to um, improve their productivity. So what used to cost 65 minutes, they wanted to get it down to 25 minutes, worst case 35 minutes. So clear requirements, okay, and very vital and critical for them in their market. Anyway, the design is estimated to take, uh, to save 20 minutes. And it's estimated to have, uh, that is that is 50% of the way from 65 to 25, you see, okay, it goes down to 45 minutes. Uh, uh, they delivered this design in a week, they measured it, they actually saved 38 minutes, which was 95% of what they needed to do. So the design was twice as good as they thought it would be, and that's very good. Then they continue until uh, all their goals are delivered. They had four parallel teams working in parallel on 25 in total simultaneous uh, objectives like these usability objectives. That's what Musk does also, a lot of parallel work to make uh, the total cycle time uh, uh, um, useful. Anyway, uh, case study. By the way, this company went out to win the world markets and take over all their competitors within the year. So a very good business success with this model. Um, okay, so this is the point about accelerating and uh, a little bit more detail down here. Uh, I found this quite fascinating. Uh, uh, Elon Musk was invited by the CEO of Volkswagen to come and uh, uh, hold a talk for his executives. And uh, he was, uh, uh, first he thought it was quite strange that Tesla had sold more cars in Germany than Volkswagen, even though Tesla didn't even have a factory in Germany. So the Germans prefer the Tesla cars, interestingly enough. And then he uh, is saying that our cycle time 
for uh, getting a car out is 30 hours. We hope to get down to 20 hours. Uh, by the way, Tesla already uh, in, uh, has 10 hours per car in their uh, Model 3. So Tesla far ahead in cycle time of a much more experienced car manufacturer called uh, Volkswagen. So th this is uh, acceleration in practice and the result of it. And by the time Volkswagen gets down to 10 hours per car, guess what? I think Musk will be at three hours per car. Let's see. Okay. So finally, automation, uh, but not too much. And he also makes this interesting statement, deliver the automation in incrementally, one at a time and make it work. He made the big mistake recently, last three years, four years, of putting in automation throughout the production line all at once. This is big bang waterfall and it didn't work, okay? So he had to go back and figure out one part of the assembly at a time, how to automate, where to automate, where not to automate. He had to finally do it incrementally anyway. Didn't save a lot of time by automating everything at once. Uh, another thing he's doing, which I'm very much in favor of, he is, uh, especially uh, with the Model 3, Tesla Model 3, he designed it to be easy to manufacture. And that means easy to use automation. Okay, this was not true of the earlier Tesla models. And that's why he can sell it more cheaply and get a bigger market share and things like that. Um, uh, okay, enough of that. Uh, quite lovely link here to watching the automation on a video. If you like to do that kind of stuff, it's quite nice. So, and then this is his uh, uh, six point. <clears throat> I read a book recently called Liftoff. There's the citation. It's all about the early history of space X, which is now 20 years old. <clears throat> and um, this is one of the employees, uh, 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 Flo Lee, and try playing about with a rocket. But uh, she, she cites Musk in, in one, one thing he did was he hired some of the best people he could find in the whole world with his great powers of per persuasion but then he remained uh, super involved. So he uh, is quite amazing at uh, maybe spending one day a week at SpaceX and one day a week at uh, the uh, German, new German uh, Tesla production plant flying around on his private plane. But he is uh, directly uh, working with the engineering teams, helping them make decisions, supporting them, encouraging them. So he's a great ex leadership example of a top leader who knows the technology in depth and can work together with his expert uh, specialists. But what he does, is he keeps people focused on the vision, you know, that we're going to Mars, okay? <laughs> we will have the world's greatest electrical car and it will be greater than any other car, electrical or not, the bigger picture, okay? So, um, now, uh, one of the things people don't seem to know very much about Tesla, everybody says, okay, it's uh, electrical, it's very fast car, it looks nice, but they, they don't talk often enough, in my opinion, about safety. Now, that has been a, a high priority by Musk. He keeps on talking about it, that, for example, he will only really release the fully automated cars when they are 10 times safer than the non-automated cars, okay? So that's one example of his focus on safety. But his focus is safety by design, by many designs, and by the leader leading and saying safety, 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 safety first, safety before profitability, safety before cost, safety before everything. And what is the result? Well, here is 50 different automobiles rated on safety by the United States Safety uh, Administration, I think it is. And here is the Model 3 safety. And here is uh, two other Tesla models. I drove Tesla S, two of them for about eight years. And then here are all the rest of the cars, of the most safe cars. 
the 50 safest. So it, it, this is quite amazing, but that's, in fact, the, the major reason I bought my Teslas recently is to keep my old body safe. If it crashes, I'm more likely to live. And I, I think that's a very good idea, okay? Um, anyway, so, um, and how does he design it to be safe? Well, one of this is the fact that there are 27 weekly increments on the production line in hardware and software. And after I get the car, I get safety updates to the software every week every week okay so um, uh, in other words is absolutely continuous improvement of the safety in the car and you can read about that in many of the references uh here okay so on uh, leadership okay i read a book earlier this year called humanocracy by a uh, harvard professor gary hamill and uh this other guy uh, Garcia. Now, humanocracy is interesting because it gives um, a, a picture of great leadership and delegation of authority in many other companies than Tesla worldwide. And it goes into great detail about how they do it. So if you'd like a handbook on the new style of, let's call it Musk-like leadership, then uh, I rec highly recommend this book. I, I'm guessing this indicates there is a Russian translation out there, but I haven't actually looked to see if I could buy it. Maybe somebody will tell me, yes, uh, I have downloaded the Kindle edition of Humanocracy in Russian or not. Uh, okay. So uh, now let's see how we're doing on time. Actually, I'm done with the first part and I could, uh, uh, would somebody give me some feedback? Would you like your 10 minute break now or would you like it in 19 minutes? If the narrative uh, suggests to stop now, maybe it's better to stop now. If you're good, moving. okay, good. Yeah, so we will take a 20, a 10 minute break now. I put on my own timer for 10 minutes. So back at one, I can see one. online if anybody would like some informal chat. Okay. And uh, let's see. Um, uh, so, Manuel, have you muted? Yeah, you can unmute. Uh, people can unmute so they can talk to me if they like, and I will be happy and, to. Uh, they can unmute themselves. I think it's. Uh... They can unmute. Okay. Yeah, 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 we can. Uh, I have Good. a quick question. If, yes. Uh, if we have some time. Uh, so, you mentioned just the uh, last slide humanocracy. There's another idea, kind of another acracy, holacracy. Uh, is it about the same or it's just kind of next step there? Uh, you know, I have not got an exact definition of holacracy. Mm -hmm. It sounds good. It sounds like whole, whole system thinking, but I don't know it in detail enough to compare it. I suspect it is there are two different ideas with some resemblances, like holistic thinking. Oh, okay. It's just um, uh, several companies uh, in the United States and worldwide implemented that um holacracy yeah holacracy like zappos and then some other attempts uh to do it they like they flatten the um uh, hierarchy um of um, um like the, the the usual like you have a manager and a middle manager and a lower manager and stuff so instead they have circles which is similar to what you mentioned um right uh and, okay. Uh, uh, Elon Musk now, use pods. number one, I challenge. Do two things. I would appreciate if you would email me I the, okay. your reference to holacracy, uh -huh. and I challenge you to make a little table comparing holacracy with humanocracy. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll do that, that. Yeah, and then share it with everybody. But I would like that table too, because I, I need to inform myself better about holacracy and I. Admit I have not done it. I'm sorry, <laughs> but you will help me. Okay. Uh, thank you. There's Dennis, right? Yes, that's me, Dennis. Yes. Nik Nicholas or something. Nikolski, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, I don't mind if you have your picture there and I can see you. <laughs> well, I'll, 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 share, I'll share my uh, camera on just a second. <laughs> yeah, so.
There uh, we go. Hello. Yeah, hi. Hello. Okay. And I guess. So I will actually use that picture in uh, the contact I will create for you when you send me an email. Then I've oh, yeah. I yeah. recognize you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll do that. Thank you. Okay. Any other remarks or questions? Just a quick question. Good afternoon. Anton, hi. Anton. Yes. Uh, is the painting also included in the process? Because like this is like the weakest oh, sorry, point. I didn't hear the word. Is the what? The painting of the car body also ah, included. Okay, painting of car, right. I, uh, uh, I believe, yes, I'm sure it is. I even remember uh, uh, some discussion of the painting itself. So yes, it is. Thank you, because this is like the weakest point of the whole process, because like painting takes like much more time than the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I remember some discussion about painting. Uh, I forget all the details, but I, uh, it, it definitely there. Um, actually, uh, I uh, when I ordered my Tesla three, I insisted on having red color, even though it cost three thousand dollars more just to get red instead of white. So there's obviously something expensive in the painting process of painting the town red. I'm not sure why, but I I wanted red. You'll see a picture of my car later. <laughs> Love the red Thank car. You. Yes. Thank you. Other questions or remarks? I should maybe drink a little. Have, have you have you met Elon Musk in person? Yes. Or talked? Oh, you have. Yeah. I'm just curious, how is he in person? Like like a normal human okay. being or now, different? Yeah. Now, I didn't have a long conversation with him. <laughs> so I, I, I'll tell you uh, how I got my bragging rights that I met Elon you know, Musk. Uh, Norway um, had uh, 10,000 Teslas sold when America also had a total of 10,000 cars. So little Norway, population 5 million, had ordered as many Tesla cars as the whole of the United States at one point. Now, the reason was the Norwegian government decided to go electric, go green, and reduced enormous taxes on the car. So in Norway, the car was half price, and everybody wanted one. So, uh, but this helped finance Tesla, literally, so they could get to the cheaper cars. And so uh, Elon Musk came often to Norway. It was a big market for him still is and uh, so one day uh, we tesla owners about this is about 2014 were invited uh, to an auditorium where um, um, uh, musk was going to hold a lecture and he did and then at the end they said does anybody have any questions and i norwegians are very shy no norwegian is going to ask a question in english in public there too shy somebody would discover they don't speak public. So I said, this is my chance to speak to Elon Musk. So I got up like, and, and asked my question. Now the joke is I had secretly ordered Model X, but I didn't dare tell my wife. She would say, what are you spending all that money on the car? You already have a Model S. What is your problem, Tom? Your boys and their toys. So I didn't tell my wife, but she was in the auditorium with me so I got up and said, uh, Mr. Musk, or something like, what if, if we already have a Model S, and remember everybody in the auditorium had the Model S because the owners were invited, what would be the benefit of ordering a Model X? So I wanted him to sell my wife on the car. <laughs> and he mentioned you could- This is uh, genius, this is genius. This yeah. You <laughs> so, should remember that trick. He mentioned the advantages of Model X and then afterwards, I said, well, darling, do you want to buy the Model X? Uh, Elon Musk said it's a much safer, better car. So that, but this, now I was planning to go backstage and talk to Elon about my methods, but he w disappeared very quickly. I couldn't get a hold of him. I did meet his, his IT chief who sat in front of me in the audience and got his name and card and planned to follow up a little bit. But, uh, uh, so, but the long story short, uh, that was my entire interaction with Elon Musk. <laughs> and I'm sure he was very bored with the stupid question about a Model X. He would rather talk about the deep technology of the car. 
Uh, I have a little dialogue going with Elon right now. You'll find on my LinkedIn. And that is, uh, you will maybe remember that the World Food Program, is there, we have seven minutes, yeah. The World Food Program chief, Beardley or Beadley or something like that, he challenged the millionaires, the billionaires, to give a little percentage of their uh, fortune to uh, uh, feed the, uh, the world, to solve the hunger problem. And he suggested that $6 billion from Elon Musk would be very nice. Their entire last year budget was about $7.7 .7 billion, by the way, and that would solve world hunger. Elon Musk replied, I would happily give you $6 billion. By the way, he's at this point has uh, shares worth $300 billion. Okay, so that's just a little drop in the bucket. Uh, and he has recently cashed in, I forget, was it $10 billion uh, to pay his taxes and things. Anyway, um, so he said, I would do that if you would uh, give me convincing documentation what you would do with the money, you know, what, what effect it would have. So he's, uh, and, and so, uh, and, and uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, the World Food Program published uh, I, and I just saw the news announcement, 16th of November, they published what they would do with the money, you know, but it was very rough. It, it, it said where they would spend money. It didn't actually say how many people would not be hungry. Okay, so I don't like what they did. I wrote, um, I wrote a, uh, on LinkedIn, I said, uh, good, Elon, you should ask them what they do. Remember I said, told you I wrote a book on the United Nations Sustainability Goals? Well, they have very bad goal formulation. And that's my, what my book is about. You can read about it. So I don't trust United Nations to have clear goals for spending their money at all. So I wrote in my link, number one, you should be skeptical about their requirements or goals. Remember, that's not the number one principle we're talking about here, right? It's number one principle. Get clear goals. Get right goals. So um, uh, uh, number one, you should get clear you know, how many people are going to be uh, not so hungry is really what counts and where, okay? Not how much money they're going to spend in Africa, which is what they have replied with, I think. Okay, I don't have all the details. And then the other thing is you should do it in small increments, like 5% of the money at a time and measure the result and see if it's the results they promised you. And I said, by the way, this program should not be managed by United Nations. They are incompetent. It should be managed by Musk employees. That's my LinkedIn. <laughs> so I'm having a bit of fun with that. Now, we had a 10 minute break. Yeah, so... thank you for such cool answer. Yeah, that's <laughs> Okay, yeah, I'm having fun. Uh, actually, secretly, of course, I'm hoping that Musk will uh, 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 and talk to me on Twitter and say, Tom, here is $10 billion. Would you please manage the program? And of course, I will say yes. <laughs> we'll see. Um, now, okay, so section two, engineering. Uh, so this is largely based on a little uh, book I wrote for a friend of mine uh, in September, October called Success. The detailed link to it is on the last slide. The success book. Um, long story, I'll give you a long story short about success there. I have a lot of friends in the agile community, very senior people, and many of them are very unhappy with the direction it has taken. Um, let's put it this way. It is, it is failing all over the place, and people are charging a lot of money for very little training, like a, a two-day certification, and you don't learn anything. So, uh, it, it, and it's turned into a mafia racket, really. They're just selling certifications and the results are terrible. Uh, you know, we're still at 50% total failure of everything, uh, more or less, very rough approximation, but look it up, I, uh, agile, uh, agile system failure or something like that. So uh, uh, we decided that we would not try to improve agile we would go one level higher. Why do people want Agile? And the reason is they think they will be more successful. Okay, so why not focus on success as the requirement, not 
agile. Agile is just a tool. And it turns out most of it is a bad tool. By the way, Elon Musk is an example of a good tool, good agile. Okay. He is the good agile. But most agile you find floating around uh, from scrum to safe and in between is bad agile, is 50% failure agile. Okay. So, uh, so we decided to pivot to uh, success. And then I wrote a, the success book um, in a few weeks for this friend of mine. Uh, it is uh, the details of how to get success. So you will get some flavor of that book here. I have literally extracted the nice picture and uh, a one sentence from the book um, so that uh, you begin to see the uh, ideas there. Let's see. Okay. Now, so now what is success? By the way, last night about three in the morning, I found an academic paper, which I inserted at the end of this series of slides, a research paper on success in software engineering done by a man at Lancaster University in uh, United States called uh, Paul Ralph. Okay. So you'll find that reference and everything there. So just before I went to bed last night at 3.30 in the morning, uh, and I, sh I should have gone to bed earlier, <laughs> uh, I inserted that. So success is something that is being academically studied, interesting enough, okay? Anyway, I have my own opinion about what success is. And in simple terms, if you have certain requirements like getting to Mars and uh, having a colony, and you get there and you have a colony, then you, Elon Musk, are successful. And if you don't get there, and that is what you wanted to do, then you are not successful. It's a pretty simple idea. Okay, so success is reaching your stated goals, your continuously improved requirements and goals. Okay, so what is failure? And uh, uh, it is any negative degree of deviation from that. Okay, in other words, we got to Mars 10 years later. We only got two people on Mars, not 200. Uh, uh, of the two people, one of them died, 50% death rate, not too good. Okay, so, uh, so in this book, I not only focus on how to get to success, in other words, to achieve your requirements, but I also focus on how to avoid large scale failure of the whole project. Okay, small failure, in increments is okay. It's a learning process, learn early. But big failure is when you totally give up the idea of colonization of Mars or getting to um, uh, 1.5 degrees of uh, uh, temperature change or so, as in the climate change uh, pro program and things like that. Okay, let's see. Now, um, here is a simple example of uh, requirements again. Uh, afford, uh, this is from <clears throat> trying to plan global health and education in Oslo. It's what I do in my workshop classes. I get, uh, we pick an interesting subject and the class works on the subject. And so these are actually students of mine um, and uh, they pick out a critical goal affordability of education that's called a tag. And then they write down an ambition level, free preschool and school education for everyone, also cheaper, uh, misspelled, to go to university than to eat at a restaurant. Okay. <laughs> now, this is what we call the bullshit level. And you find these everywhere, like all over the United Nations sustainability planning. But in my language, we go, we say, this is not a clear enough goal. Okay. Uh, it has too much, uh, for example, Free, how free is free? Who is everyone? Uh, uh, what does it mean, go to university? What does it mean to eat at restaurants? There's a lot of uh, ambiguity here. So uh, uh, in language, we try to reduce the ambiguity to make things clear so nobody can misunderstand. So um, uh, first thing we do is we define a scale of measure, percentage of children in given areas that can afford education, and then we define children, areas, and education, invisible here, but we can, uh, it becomes more visible here. And then we take a look at the systems analysis. Well, we are at 58%, where children are kids, 
area is Africa and education is defined as seven years of education and there's the date, okay? Then we set a short-term goal, 65 for these things, for that date in the future and a longer term goal for 2027, four years later, again, for the same parameters. Uh, we also um, uh, list stakeholders, <coughs> a favorite topic of mine, and I wrote a book about stakeholders in June this year, which you can find for free somewhere. If you can't find it and you're interested in stakeholders, ask me. Okay, so, th uh, so this is example of clear requirement in language. Okay, for anything, for any stakeholder uh, value. Now, I, uh, I normally use one day to train people in all of this. So obviously in my one minute for the slide, I can only uh, teach so much, but hopefully you're at least picking up the idea. This might be an interesting way to do uh, requirements. And, I and you know you will find all the information about these things in the competitive engineering book. Okay. Now, uh, here's another uh, idea. You might not know what the requirements are initially, real success, but you can learn incrementally with feedback. So this is exactly the principle that I use in my, uh, my agile method called EVO for evolutionary value delivery, EVO, the first uh, published agile method, by the way. In my book, Princip no, uh, in my book, Principles of Software Engineering Management, 1988. See if you have a copy in your library. I doubt it, but you, you can still buy it. Um, okay. And um, uh, but the, the in other words, you might not know exactly what the requirements are, but you can learn by feedback and uh, of various kinds uh, what the requirements should be, and then you will have a better and better definition of success as you go along. Here's another, uh, uh, this is uh, from planning a reduction of pollution in London. Again, it's a British Computer Society class tackling the problem where the first day is stating the requirements and the second day is the uh, strategy or architecture for uh, reaching the goals, okay? But you see, language is a language uh, which uh, defines re requirements in a series of parameters with different kinds of information. Okay, that's, and then here's sort of an overview. We're trying to uh, move from uh, benchmarks like these over to uh, future states like these, long story short. Okay, now, Success is not just extreme safety of the Tesla, to refer back to, to Musk's uh, uh, goals. Success is balanced. In other words, Musk is not just striving for extreme safety. He's very conscious. He has to reduce the cost of manufacture so that he can reduce and he has to increase the flow, the quantity of cars to 500,000 to a million. And he has to reduce the cost to the consumer. Uh, okay. And he also has to have a car that looks good. He has to have a car that can be uh, iteratively enhanced over the air with software and on and on. So Musk has a large number of requirements that define success, not just one. So what I do and what Musk does is multi-dimensional thinking simultaneously. We, we consider it at least 10 critical requirements simultaneously. Remember the example I gave of the small Norwegian company, we considered 25 quality requirements of their software product simultaneously, okay? So, uh, uh, so the, and that, the word balanced meaning uh, good enough in all the dimensions is a simple definition there. And requirements is plural and stakeholders is plural, not just the customer or the user, okay? Uh, here's another way of looking at balanced. Here, here is a uh, scale. Where, this is for United Nations um, um, principle uh, three, um, 
which is something to do with the poverty. Uh, you'll find this in the United Nations book. But uh, so, um, and we have the following concepts. We have uh, the concept of building, which is defined as these conditions. The concept of resilience, this is one of these United Nations words which are not really defined, but we've defined it as avoiding, escaping, resisting, recovering, etc. cetera. Uh, they talk about the vulnerable, poor people. Think of our friends in uh, Belarus uh, trying to get into Poland in the forest, okay? And we again define what we mean by vulnerable as uh, one or more of these conditions, okay? And then we have situations like individual poverty, family poverty, communal poverty, national poverty, and even academics. And then we have the concept of shocks, which like climate shock, economic shock. Now, um, uh, okay, so here in one single scale for one single measure, the United Nations poverty measure, we have five different factors, each of which have approximately five different conditions. And it's possible to um, have objectives for uh, uh, any combination of any of these, economic and health power, with avoiding and resisting, physically exposed, individual poverty and national poverty, and social shocks. Okay, How many combinations and permutations are there? Well, millions. Okay, Now, balanced means you're going to have to pick the most critical. That's what we do. We pick the most critical of these first, and then the most critical of resilience next, and the most critical vulnerable, most critical situations, most critical shocks. And we say, let's do that on the first increment. This is agile, but agile engineering, I call it. And I've got several lectures on agile engineering. If you probably Google it, you'll get the videos and the slides, okay? Now, but, but balanced means we have to do uh, pretty good things every in each one of these, and we have to do the most critical things first. And the let's say the least critical last. Now, what you're looking at is also a method of decomposition into small deliverable steps, which is key to agile and key to the way Musk does things, by the way. Okay. Now again. I would like an hour or two to explain all this to you. And hopefully some people have picked it up roughly. Some people have picked up the idea, I should study these qualifiers, they're called, in, uh, in, in Tom's books and things like that. Okay, But uh, I, I'm putting this up here because I'm looking at the idea of balanced requirements. And here is one single requirement that requires a lot of balancing of different factors, but they are explicit, written down in the requirement, okay? Now, what is the secret of being able to guarantee that your project will be a success? And by the way, many good people fail. Again, Google IT failure or agile failure. And you get millions of hits and much research, but it all boils down to the fact that the failure rate of software and IT projects is ridiculously high, uh, order of magnitude 50%, you know, 40 to 60, uh, total failure, and then another 40% partial failure, and uh, less than 10% success, okay? So 90% do not achieve complete success, very roughly, sometimes as low as 3% in one uh, 400 project analysis in Britain, only 3% had complete success. So, and, and these are good people, intelligent, well-educated, like you, but they fail. So I think everybody has decided it must be the method. It can't be just the people, okay? And I think they are right, okay? So um, uh, now that's what the whole success book is about. What are the methodology? What is the methodology? What are the details of the methodology of how to always succeed and never fail? Now I'll give you the answer in one slide, okay? And it's called the Gilb cycle of 
uh, uh, working on projects, okay? We can start here with our friends, the stakeholders. Remember, I wrote a whole book on it you can have called Stakeholder Engineering. Uh, then their values, which it means their qualities, what they want, their requirements. And then finally into design and architecture called the solutions for how are we gonna to get to the values. Then the decomposition that I was showing you a little bit of, how do you decompose so you get small steps. Uh, Musk is at the, the one step every 12 hour working day level. Okay, for example, when in rocket design. Okay, but so we need to decompose his project to get to Mars in 50 years, maybe after he dies, he's recognized into one day steps. And that book Liftoff I referred to uh, shows you how he decomposes into the small steps for rocketry, okay? And uh, decomposition is intellectual. You know, I have a theory, here is my decomposition. Then we have to take one of the decompositions, the earliest one we're gonna deliver and develop it, uh, whatever that means, by code, test, et cetera. And then we integrate it into the existing system, okay, whatever that means. And then we measure how well it did compared to our quantified objectives, which are here, and what it cost, which is here. And then we learn as rapidly as possible. Every day, Musk is fanatic. Learn today and do something about your learning today, both for your product, your rocket, and for your process, your team, your group. Okay, And then the cycle continues as Dr. Deming told me, and I spent a lot more time with Dr. W. Edwards Deming. He used to take him to the ballet in London. And uh, uh, the, the question was, uh, the, when, does, when do you start the cycle? And the answer is, if it's a rapid cycle, you can start anywhere. And the second question is, does the cycle have an ending? And Deming's answer is, it never ends as long as you are in competition. So it's a process, in other words, it's a never ending cycle. And Musk uh, is certainly in that never ending cycle with rockets and cars and everything else he does, the boring stuff. So, so th this is my answer. The key is in this diagram. If you do this the way I am advising or the way that Musk is doing in practice, then you will succeed like Musk and like my clients. Okay, who use these methods. We'll get back to them. Okay, so I believe that predictable success is the result of engineering and persistence, never give up in spite of failures. Okay, Musk had to blow up a few rockets before he got one that lifted off at all and then lifted off into space and not to mention could go to the uh, take payloads to the International Space Station. So persistence, never give up and uh, learn from failure, but don't give up. Keep your vision in front of you. And then I have this word conservative engineering disciplines. I mean conventional, good old Egyptian and Roman engineering. Okay. <laughs> Nothing new, thousands of years old, very disciplined, not just uh, hacking it and throwing in ideas and pushing on and then failing, which is what uh, too many software people do. So we, we software engineers have to learn to be engineers, not programmers. You hear me? I have a word for programmers. I call them soft crafters, soft crafters, okay? And engineers, that's different. That is not writing code, okay? And so uh, if we want to be sure we will have success uh, at the end of a series of iterations anyway, or after a certain series, then I believe engineer, real engineering is the, uh, the, the, the answer. A, um, a student of mine who is a professional consultant in Stockholm, uh, UC, uh, did another diagram of my cycle. And so it's got more detail on it. And it's quite, quite fun. So, but it's, it's just more detail on the same cycle that I was showing you and we won't use time to go 
into that, but you can have it. Why do people not succeed even though we publish the secret of success? For example, it, it, Musk has essentially published his ideas, okay? I have published my ideas, for example, in, well, my competitive engineering book. Uh, well, people don't listen. They say, oh, Musk is different, or Musk is space, I'm not space. Musk is cars, I'm not cars. They make all kinds of excuses. Uh, they say, Tom Gilb is talking about software, so I can't use his methods. Or Tom Gilb's methods are too difficult and complicated engineering. I want something simple like Scrum with product owners. You know, so people have all kinds of reasons for avoiding learning how to succeed and they fail and they fail and they fail. So in other words, it's, it's not like success is a secret. Uh, success in engineering with very complex systems is several thousand years of engineering history, building pyramids and aqueducts and God knows what uh, in ancient times. Okay, what is the failure rate of bridge building? I looked it up once. It was not 50% of the bridges fall down. Okay, it was something like 0 0.05. Bridges do fall down, like the Tacoma Bridge and things like that. But it's a very small percentage because they use good engineering principles. They don't just say to a carpenter, here's a hammer, a saw and some wood and make me a bridge. They don't do it that way, not a big bridge. Here's a lovely quotation from a friend of mine who I have unfortunately not met, uh, but I visited his home in Italy, Leonardo da Vinci. And it starts off wonderfully. Life is pretty simple. Now, maybe you are struggling with life, isn't everybody? And it doesn't seem so simple. <laughs> okay, but anyway, if you are Leonardo da Vinci or Elon Musk, maybe life is pretty simple. Anyway, you do some stuff. You can you deliver an increment to your system, an increment of value. Most fails. So he is acquainted with the idea of failure on on increments. Some works. You do more of what works. If it works big, others like Volkswagen will quickly copy it. Then you do something else. As I said, by the time Volkswagen, who is 10 years behind, has caught up with Tesla, they will be doing something entirely different. Mark my words. The trick, as Elon Musk knows, is doing something else. Isn't that lovely? Simple life for geniuses 500 years ago. Life is pretty simple. Sorry, can I can I interrupt? Sorry, that's me again, Dennis. Um, I have I have a question before we move too far. So you were uh, talking about uh, success in engineering, and what are your thoughts about uh, discovery versus engineering? Is it the same thing or not? And, uh, you, you need to define uh, define discovery. I know the word, yeah. but I don't know how you are using it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe I can uh, use the example that you use for bridges. Go ahead. Uh, for me, as a software developer, I'm expected not only build a bridge, but uh, success is judged by how many people go through this bridge, or do they even need to go there? So I need to build a bridge as cheaply as possible figure out if people want to go to the other side of the river and it has to be a good bridge yeah so there's so many ways i things can go wrong like one i build a beautiful bridge spend a lot of money nobody goes there it's it's a failure i build a crappy bridge people go there and they die it's a failure and all those all those things so <clears throat> Okay, um, let, me, let, me, let me stop you there. Yeah, okay. By the way, I have something I do with my students, and I'm going to do it with you. Please formulate your question in 10 words or less. Now, we're, uh, we won't do that now, but I'm, I'm challenging everybody. I, I'll, I'll, I can, I'll try to do that. Okay. Do you think 
that uh, discovery of usefulness is different from engineering. Pretty good. 11, you can, uh, that you can remove, it's, it's 11 words, but that doesn't count, so yes. I'll, I'll remove articles then yeah. and uh, what can yeah, No, pretty, pretty good, pretty good. Um, now, uh, I still don't completely understand what you mean by word discovery. So in 10 words or less, define discovery. Do I need to do it or not? Yeah, you do. Because I, I have um, 1 million different uh, possible interpretations of discovery. Like I have discovery channel on my television. That was my definition. Discovery is do I need to do it or not? Is oh, useful? sorry. Do I? I thought yeah, you need that to was a, the discovery that definition. Was a definition. Yeah, that yes. was ambiguous. Okay. <laughs> that was okay. ambiguous. Uh, yeah. Do I need to do it or not? Uh, uh, okay. Uh -huh. Okay. That's interesting definition. Um, and okay. Now, number one, you were referring to the fact that you have a multi dimensional problem. You know, the bridge is good quality. People come to the bridge or not. Those are two dimensions. Okay. So first thing is, in any project, you need to identify the uh, critical dimensions. That's number one engineering task. What are your critical dimensions? In other words, a critical dimension is defined as something that if it goes very badly, the whole system will fail. So in your body, you have a critical thing, your brain. You have another critical thing, your heart. Okay? If brain fails, your brain dead. If heart fails, you died of heart failure, right? So, the, so I use the word critical here. We must identify the critical stakeholders, which are defined as those who have critical factors that we as engineers need to engineer towards. And only by succeeding in all critical factors do we have complete success. If you have nine successes and one failure in critical factors, your whole bridge is essentially a failure, okay? I mean, like maybe they will just tear it down, decommission it, bomb it, okay? So I'm trying to answer your, your, your question uh, indirectly. Recognize you are dealing with multi-dimensional problem. Uh, focus on the critical dimensions, define them quantitatively and clearly, and then engineer your way towards the successful levels, the goal levels, we call them. That's my, I think that's my answer. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, pretty much. And um, okay. I do okay. understand that there's multiple dimensions. That's a good um, starting point. And criti yeah, my, critical yeah. dimensions, the word critical. There yeah, are some yeah. non-critical dimensions and you shouldn't use too much energy on them. That's what Musk calls he talks about this, the requirements and designs that are false and misleading. They're not critical. Thus, principle one and two of Musk is don't spend your energy on the non-critical things. Okay? Back to that. Now, we, we could uh, obviously discuss this for an hour or two, but then nobody would hear the rest of my lecture. So I'll move on. <laughs> and you and I can have a discussion by email or otherwise, if you want later, Dennis. Happy Thank you. Day. Thank you for taking uh, time to answer the question. Well, thanks for the question. Okay. So let's see, moving right along. Let's see. Now, of course, there we go. The secret of avoiding failure is quite different from the secret of reaching success. Okay. Uh, we need to be efficient. Now, efficient is a word I define as delivering values for low resources. Okay, you might say profitable to keep it really simple, right? But value to cost. Now, be efficient and uh, be efficient early. In other words, every increment you deliver should have extremely high value for extremely low costs. Okay, and do this day by day by day, week by week by week, continuously. This is what Musk does. Now, if you get to a stage where you say, my next increment will have low value and high cost, and it's the best step I can think of, there is no better one, then it's time to stop, because if you continue, you will enter into failure territory. 
Okay. In other words, we can we can avoid failure by measurement of value and cost, and by knowing when to stop. Okay. So here's a simple little uh, chart. There. Let's just say th this is some kind of uh, profitability, and uh, we're profitable, profitable, profitable. But our trajectory is towards non-profitability, and the question is: Do you stop here, or stop here, or stop here? Or do you go into non-profitable engineering and stop here? Or do you keep on wasting time and money and get into complete failure on a large scale? Okay. And what I'm advising is somewhere along here, you said, I'm heading in the wrong direction. Maybe I should stop here where I still have some profitability. Okay. That's how to avoid failure. Simple advice. Yeah. Would, uh, and again, this is the same, uh, would you like to never fail? This means uh, never fail on a large scale, your whole project. It doesn't mean never fail on a small one day step. We're going to fail on one day step and we're going to learn that day why we failed. We're gonna correct our engineering design and try again until it works, until the rocket finally takes off as opposed to explodes, okay? Um, old wisdom, uh, this is a little bit of the same thing. It's not exactly the same thing. When it is obvious that goals cannot be reached, in other words, you can't get the value you wanted, do not adjust the goals, in other words, requirements, adjust the action steps, what are the action steps? They are your design, your strategy, your architecture decomposed into small steps. This advice from Confucius, long time ago. My advice also. So I made a list of failure avoidance principles and to go through each one in great detail would break my time limit se severely here, so I won't do it, but uh, it's roughly what I said, you know, that we need to focus on uh, small incremental successes, and we need to see where we're running out of ideas, we're running out of technology, we're running out of resources, and it's time to stop and declare success and not go further and turn success up to now into a failure of, on a large scale, okay? So this is agile as it should be. Agile meaning deliver high value to cost incrementally from day one and stop when the, you have entered territory where there are not enough good strategies, not enough good economics to continue. Okay, so this is chapter three of the success book. So the, the numbers refer to the chapters there and defining success up front. Now, uh, where does this idea of success come from? And I say it comes from what I call stakeholders. I hope that's a term you have learned something about. If not, I refer you to my new free book called Stakeholder Engineering, talked about before. Uh, and in particular, we have a class of stakeholders called critical stakeholders. <coughs> and the reason they are critical is they have a requirement that if you don't meet it, your entire project is dead. Okay, so it's very important to identify critical stakeholders and their one or more critical requirements. Okay. Uh, here is a simple list of stakeholders of various kinds and types. Uh, here's an interesting class of stakeholder, antagonist, your enemy, your competitor. Uh, we have too often uh, in software, we focus on the user and the customer. They sound like nice people. We need to please them. No, we need to also defeat the competitor. Musk needs also to defeat Volkswagen and Mercedes and General Motors, and he's doing it, okay? Uh, they are not his customers and users, General Motors and Volkswagen, but he is dealing with them. <clears throat> and he is explicitly saying 
my car is to provoke the other manufacturers into manufacturing a car that does not have bad emissions. Okay, he was explicitly dealing with his antagonist 10 years ago. Don't make any mistake about it. So these are different classes of stakeholders. Any medium-sized project has 10 or 20 stakeholders. One of the mistakes we make in the cultures of software engineering, like a conventional agile, uh, uh, manifesto agile, is that we keep on thinking of the user and the customer, the user and the customer. That's nice, but we need to deal with the other critical stakeholders in addition. And, and uh, mature systems engineers, military and space, have long since recognized and done this. But ordinary IT systems, uh, again, exemplified by the agile conventional culture, do not do this at all. They don't even mention stakeholder. They say the primary purpose of uh, manifesto agile is to deliver working software to the customer, okay? And that's very bad idea. Okay, um, now here, here is one uh, uh, stakeholder, the board of directors, and almost any organization or institution has a board of directors. And they are a very important stakeholder. They may determine if you get the funds and permission to do your project at all. And if they don't like what you're doing, you, uh, you have no project suddenly. Now, notice what I've done. In Planguage, I have a, uh, 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 an object called the board, which I define as a series of Planguage statements, which give me information about this board, okay? I also, at the end, uh, uh, say that the board of directors has um, a special interest in two requirements, accessibility and adaptability. And the role there is to be the authority on accessibility and decision maker and adaptability. So here we are connecting uh, a stakeholder to um, requirements. Okay, and long story short, all stakeholders can be connected to some requirements. Okay, so, uh, and what I'm trying to do is, is raise this idea of uh, mature, detailed uh, planning uh, and information about stakeholders and how they connect to requirements. We need to uh, take these critical requirements. Another word for requirement is future improvement. And we need to clarify it above all so nobody can misunderstand it. And we uh, probably, if it's a, 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 an incremental improvement, we need to quantify it. All, all improvements are generally speaking on a scale of measure. And we need to define that scale of measure and define what level, what number we wanna to get to, to be tolerable in the first instance and uh, the worst acceptable case and to be successful in the second instance. So here is a, just a sample for the London housing project of uh, the top 10 requirements. Here is how bad they are on some scale of measure. And here is the future number of how good they wanna be. So this is just symbolic. Uh, these are all defined on a whole page, like I showed you earlier of information. So this is just a summary with the tag giving access to the larger set of information and the uh, uh, status, how bad we are today and the future success. These are all success levels, but short summary, okay? So uh, the, the, the values that the stakeholders have, that's values of stakeholders means what they need, what they want, what they feel they need. Those are, if you can deliver them, you will be successful in the eyes of the stakeholders. If you do not deliver them, you will be a failure in the eyes of the stakeholders. And the stakeholders might be like European Union with laws about privacy. And they might tell you, even if you are Google or Facebook, you are not allowed to use this product in the whole European Union. It is illegal. Okay, that's a powerful. And by the way, you have an $800 million fine to pay 
for your lack of pri privacy or uh, competitiveness or so something like that. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so it, it, the stakeholder values, it is the, the stakeholders and their values that determine whether you're successful or not. Now, that doesn't mean all values of stakeholders that you must do anything with them. They could be, from your point of view, low priority, and your project is not going to do them. So they can wish for anything they want. Your project doesn't have to do anything. It has a scope, and it has to work within its scope. And so some values it will try to deliver because they're critical to your project, and some values it will not. Okay? And we can get back to that. How do we decide which values we will not prioritize? And I have written a great deal about dynamic prioritization based on the quantification of values and the costs of strategies and things like that. Okay. So here's another example, uh, air quality uh, of, uh, uh, this is the symbolically the scale of measure. Uh, this is how bad we are. Uh, the details are here and there's more detail here. If we take the one liner, click it, open a window and get maybe one page of detail for each one of these. Uh, and then we are trying to get to the worst acceptable case, these levels. Uh, here's detail on this one. It's for senior people in five years' time in uh, carbon monodioxide in Greater London by 2022. And the level we want to get to is 200 people. Okay. So, uh, so this is a uh, decomposed, structured uh, requirement level, tolerable level. And then we have another tolerable level, which is even better, probably later. And we have some goal. tolerable. This is worst acceptable case. This is success levels. Goal is defined as the success level where the stakeholder says, I'm really happy. I don't want to spend any more money or time. A stretch level is even better than the goal but maybe we cannot do it technologically. It may be outside the state of the art, outside of our current people, time, money, resources, but we still might like to get down to zero uh, pollution or zero, uh, 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 let's see, number of persons dying is what this is. So zero people dying in London from air quality would be very nice, okay? Okay, defining the worst acceptable case. Now I showed you the tolerable levels. Here's a, one way of thinking about it. Here is our scale of measure for one of many factors. And here is our success level, the goal. Anything at the goal or beyond is success range. Anything below the goal, but above the tolerable uh, limit is tolerable. We can live with it while we're maybe working incrementally to get to the success level. So Musk is very often here. Musk always starts here with rockets that blow up. Then he gets to the point where the rocket lifts off, but it doesn't carry a payload, but it's still pretty good. And then finally, he can carry the payload of uh, Russian cosmonauts to the International Space Station and take over the business from Russia. Not bad. Russians were probably unhappy with that. Okay. Um, and, and here's the way, simple way we state this uh, level, a tolerable level down there, and the uh, goal level. Wish means the stakeholder wishes, and goal means uh, it is considered technologically and economically possible. Therefore, the project is committed to doing it. This wish might be too optimistic. It might be outside the state of the art. And uh, uh, so we register it as the wish of the stakeholder, but we do not commit to delivering it in the project. That's a very important idea. We do not commit to whatever the stakeholder says they want. We commit to what is technologically possible and economically possible. Okay. And finally, we have to, uh, have to think about costs. Uh, here, we're looking at a series of uh, one, two, three, four, five different strategies on what we call an impact estimation table. And for each strategy, we're looking at the capital cost, the cost in calendar days, 
and the cost in uh, employees of uh, each. This is percentage of budget. So, uh, and we, we can even see that some of these solutions are very cheap, 25, and some of them are very expensive like this one and this one. So, uh, and then we can look at the value to cost ratio and say that this one has the best value to cost ratio. So maybe we should do this strategy first, but we're looking at the multi-dimensional economics. And it's amazing how many methods do not look at the economics at all. They don't even look at the cost of each design. They may have a budget for the project, which they overrun by factor 3.14 but they don't actually cost each individual design or strategy in three or four dimensions. And uh, proper engineering that I'm recommending, you are aware of the multidimensional costs in relation to your budget, 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 your deadline and things like that. That is what I, I'm increasing my definition of proper engineering. We look at the, the long-term and short-term financial people and time resources needed. And we do so with impact estimation tables, which you can read about in uh, chapter, nah, uh, a chapter in the competitive engineering book. I talked about different conditions earlier. So uh, here is an example. Here are four, five different wishes where I'm changing the conditions of the skill level from beginner, uh, and, and then there's one level and one date. I actually got the same date all the way through here. And then uh, 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 all of the employees, advanced skill level, expert skill level, et cetera. So I'm, uh, I'm changing the conditions to um, describe a critical set of conditions that I wish to focus my energies on. So I will be successful for the critical things. Okay, again, I would love to spend one whole day teaching you, exercising you and doing this, but I hope some of you are at least picking up the idea, aha, I can have multiple dimensions in the same requirement. Okay, and I can use the different conditions for these, uh, what I call qualifiers, skill level employees are the different, uh, see, employees and skill level are the different con uh, qualifiers and skill level has a condition called expert and uh, a beginner, for example, and intermediate. Um, uh, you can also define success not as one point that it's suddenly achieved and then you're done. You can define success as a, a series of long-term improvements, maybe keeping constant the success you have in the long-term or uh, spreading the success to more people, more places, more uh, applications, or uh, maybe increasing the level of success as we go along. In other words, we can, with one specification of uh, one uh, um, uh, value requirement, uh, we can define uh, many future levels of success, as many as we like. So we can have a rich, forward, long-term picture, numerically, measurably, so that, for example, an architect can say, I must architect so as to reach the long-term objectives, or so as to make that possible in the long-term, maybe by designing an adaptable architecture that can adapt to new technologies would be the way, because uh, I know I have to do something that is not possible with current technologies, therefore my architecture must easily, let's say, plug and play modular technologies. I must be able to do that. Uh, I was reading a paper I can supply to people uh, from the head of the United Kingdom terrorist organization, ter anti-terrorist organization, sorry. And one of the things he reviewed over 10 years 
was the technology of terrorists was changing so rapidly, they never seemed to catch up with it. And in particular, with their IT systems, they never caught up with how they should manage the different IT databases all over England, not just the police terrorist database, but the school, the medical database. And so his conclusion was that the, they needed to design so that they could, for example, integrate databases in 10 years quickly, not by having a 10 year IT project, but this month we need to integrate the school database because that's where the signals are about terrorists, okay? So, uh, so in other words, it, it, it was a major class of project, anti-terrorist uh, police projects, and, and my methods are being used on those projects these days, which is all I can tell you without having to shoot you. And uh, one of the observations, one of the learnings from the top anti-terrorist guy was that we have not uh, realized how fast everything is changing and that we have to build our IT system so we can change them extremely quickly. You know, in other words, this year, not with a new eight-year project which fails, which is exactly what they have done, eight-year projects that fail, okay? So that's not good enough. Um, okay, now here, uh, some stakeholder values are mainly interesting in the long term, not just on the first day or year of operation. So here we have from chapter five of the competitive engineering book, and there is a special uh, link to it right there directly. Uh, here is a set of qualities which occur in almost any system. Those, there are the resources I was talking about. Uh, here's the usability we saw examples of in the Norwegian case. Uh, but here is a set of things, we can call them the adaptability set, which include things like uh, interchangeability, installability, portability, upgradability. And all of these are quantifiable. Most people don't know that and they don't know how to do it. But it is spelled out in detail how you quantify these in this book, right? And here is one example. Here is the technical debt one. I call it maintainability. Now, any good engineer knows that the basic measure of maintainability is mean time to repair. Think of how fast can I fix a bug? How fast can I repair a, a database? And uh, here is a very charming thing I found in advanced engineering from 1966. Here is maintainability decomposed into about 10 different kinds of uh, elements of maintainability. Put another way, here's a way of defining technical debt. And some of my clients, like the Norwegian client I mentioned, has done exactly this. And every month they spent one week improving these factors and reducing their technical debt, which had accumulated for eight years before they started tackling it. So this has been... I can give you a case study of practical use at Confirmit is the name of the company which has done this advanced engineering in practice, okay? But that's interesting. Did you know that maintainability uh, doesn't just have a simple measure of mean time to repair, but uh, here are the different phases of repair, including all the testing after the repair, and they each take time. They're each separate processes. They each need to be me measured separately and they need to be designed and architected separately, okay? But this, uh, if you do this early, or at least as soon as possible, you can reduce your technical debt and make it easier to maintain the old systems rather than trying to rebuild completely new systems. And by the way, the completely new system will probably have equally bad technical debt to the old one because you're still not understood, you have to engineer the reduction of technical debt from the beginning, okay? All right. So um, we need to let stakeholders dream. What are, my, what are their needs? We, 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 we shouldn't just say, I don't wanna do that, we don't wanna do it, or we think it's too expensive, or we think it's technologically impossible. If Musk wants to dream about colonies on Mars, let Musk dream about colonies on Mars. 
If Musk wishes to dream of all electrical non-emitting cars on the planet, let him dream. Okay. And maybe challenge him, go out and prove it can be done, which he in fact did. Okay. Then uh, we look at the dream of the stakeholder, and now we do our engineering, getting practical and economic, and then we see what can we in fact deliver? What is within the state of the art? What does it cost? Can we afford what it costs? Okay, so here's another example of um, the, uh, a requirement. Um, and uh, uh, here is a wish. So wish, remember, is defined as the stakeholder need expressed by the stakeholder, okay? We don't know if we can deliver it. We don't know if it is technologically possible. Maybe it will be in 10 years. Maybe it's not in the next five years. Uh, maybe you have to say, sorry, you can't have your wish. It is not currently uh, within the state of the art, okay? But we, it might say, yes, it's within the state of the art, but it costs $300 billion and you don't have the money. Oh, yes, I do, says Elon Musk. Okay, give me your $300 million. We'll give you your wish. Uh, at some point, your project can move from the wish category, I have a dream, says Martin Luther King. Okay, and Martin Luther King, when he received his Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo, he uh, went out to the back of the building where he received the prize. I was in there watching him get the prize. And he was all alone, he and Coretta King, in front of a car, and he wondered where everybody was. And my wife, Sulva, and I were the only people there. So we waved at him, and he waved back at us, and he drove off, and that was my interaction with Martin Luther King. But he had a dream, and uh, his dream is gradually being fulfilled incrementally and is not quite there yet. But we're working on it. So... Um, think Black Lives Matter, and you see the work, the, the steps there. But at some point, uh, we realize that it is within the state of the art, and we have the resources to do it. Then we convert the wish level to the goal, and we tell the stakeholder, hey, your wish is our command. We can do it. Uh, we will require $300 million dollars, but you said you had it, so just put it in our bank account and we'll do it, no problem, okay? So this is the practical implementation of this idea. Let the stakeholders dream, then get practical and economic and do not promise what you cannot deliver. Goal is a promise that you can deliver. Next subject, some of the objectives are not the critical ones. They're not the most important ones. And we need to um, divide all possible objectives into different levels. Here are three different levels. One I'm calling strategic levels. One I'm calling fundamental levels. And one I'm calling the vision level. This is a real project I'm working on right now. It is a small charity that tries to make peace in the Middle East. So we are, of course, expecting to win the Nobel Prize for Peace for this work. Watch for this. And we are using uh, my methods. So the, the, the first level is what we call the vision level. This is like maybe 100 years ahead. Peace in the Middle East, sustainable. Everybody happy, okay? Now, uh, fundamental level is the, what the, this organization, which is, uh, wants to do in, say, a 10-year period, okay? And the strategic objectives is what they're doing on an, a yearly basis, the practical things they're doing, like educating people and educating youth and responding to needs and supporting, uh, you know, family and women, etc. We have quantified all of these but we have also related them on impact estimation tables. So here are the top level visions also quantified. And here are some of build constructive cooperation. So that's a fundamental level goal. And here is the estimate that this fundamental goal will deliver 94% of our vision. 
So that means it's very powerful, it's very effective. Uh, it will also deliver 100% of the second goal, 30% of the third goal, and none of the fourth goal. And so here's the rating for another strategy called multicultural uh, acceptance. So here I want to introduce the impact estimation table, which I've mentioned uh, parts of. What we do is we take any level of strategies, architecture, or objectives, and we estimate and measure later when it's implemented how they impact multiple dimensions of some higher level. So this is a very powerful tool for understanding multiple uh, levels and their impact on other multiple levels at a higher level. It's a way of understanding different levels of concern. These are extremely long range, maybe 100 years. These are maybe 10 years for the organization. And this is maybe this year. By the way, these are objectives that we decided to drop for various reasons, but we keep track of them. They're discarded values. That's an interesting practice. You know, keep track of what you discard. Maybe you discarded it prematurely for wrong reasons, and maybe you need to bring it back into play so it doesn't disappear totally. Okay. By the way, we use the numbers on these tables to decide which uh, this now becomes a strategic objective, which one of these should we prioritize and do first? And it's the one that scores the most points towards our higher level multiple goals. That's called uh, computing the priority of a strategy or strategic objective. Responsibility motivates success. Notice that Musk was very clear about assigning a requirement to a person, a named individual. Why? Well, here's how, here's how uh, Planguish does it. Planguish has a, uh, not only absolutely everything like an ambition level or a, a test process or a scale of measure or status of wish, all of these, when you go into the detailed window for each one, have, as I said, a source. Where did it come from? Who set that wish of 0 0.1? Who said the status is 10%? Who designed and developed the scale, right? I want to know exactly who did it. So that's, and make them responsible. Make them know that they are responsible and, and uh, motivate them to do the best possible job they can, okay? Now, here's another level of this. Here are uh, different types of, so authority, uh, intended readership, owner, responsible, implementation incidents, incidents uh, dependencies. These are all different levels of uh, responsibility where we're saying, you know, that for this um, value called user error frequency, the owner is this chief of UX design. Responsible for delivering this is the project UX designer. Uh, one who's going to implement it is our subcontractor called Accent, which is a joke on Accenture, and uh, et cetera. And the, we are dependent on, totally dependent on the steering committee, and they have too little time for us. Okay? So you see how language is embellishing or enriching a specification of a value requirement to do go much further than Musk. Musk just says, give me the individual who stated the requirement. I'm doing five or 10 different such things normally in a single requirement. So I believe what Musk believes in, but I practice it at a much deeper, broader level for large complex systems, pinning down the responsibility. So define success clearly. And here I have what I call principles of defining success clearly. Again, I would maybe like to spend one hour going through each one of these, but I have already done it to some degree. I will do it more. But these are the same principles that Musk has really, uh, you know, uh, that you, you cannot just have wishy-washy things like end hunger, uh, end poverty. I'm referring to the United Nations Sustainability Planning Goals. You have to go deeper and be clearer so people really understand what they are signing up to and buying into. 
and uh, otherwise people will misinterpret the goal and they will uh, uh, work in the direction of their misunderstanding and they will all fail uh, not working as a team or a, a planet together, okay? So, uh, but again, my uh, competitive engineering book is a good handbook on defining success clearly. Um, here is my definition in my glossary of system without going into more detail. Uh, here is, I'm, I'm looking at this word system. Here's a very nice complexity of managing a pandemic. So you begin to see the, the, the system of a pandemic and all its uh, uh, elements. And uh, okay, everything is connected. Again, system. So here are different uh, aspects of a system, but it looks like a very complex rat's nest. Now I said that magic word complexity. Some of you will know of my friend Dave Snowden's uh, Kinevin model of uh, complexity, which for me is oversimplified and I disagree with Dave and he agrees with me on that disagreement. So I, uh, if you're interested in complexity and wicked problems, please let me know. But uh, long story short, I, uh, I have a book called Technoscopes, which you can have a free copy of, which is 100 ways of understanding and seeing complex systems. My theory about complexity is this. People say it's complex. We don't understand it. And I say all systems have complexity. Your problem is you don't have a pair of glasses or telescopes or radar systems to see the detail and how the system works. You need technoscopes. You need my tools for like quantification of multidimensional uh, aspects. So you can see outside the black box how all this is interacting and giving certain attributes. That's my primary technoscope is multidimensional quantified thinking outside the black box. So uh, uh, again, complexity is not a problem if you have tools to, to understand the complex system. And that's our real problem in the first instance is tools to see the complexity and to manage the complexity through time. And I have detailed 100 such tools in my Technoscope's book. If you can't find a free copy, email me, you'll get it. Okay. Now, uh, we are uh, at uh, slide 63, and we have pretty good, we're actually on track, but we will take a 10 minute break now, and I will be happy to chat with people in the break, but we will resume lecturing in uh, 10 minutes minutes yeah at the uh, 310 311 yeah. uh, three, we say 310 mm -hmm. okay can i ask another question yeah. i will not uh, sorry oh. yeah, i will not i will not post the recording because maybe questions can also be interesting for sure for recording okay. fine by me and always has his hand up i see you're next okay yes. dennis go ahead dennis yeah, yeah okay um, I'll try to be short. Ten words or less, of course. Yes. Um, why are terrorists more efficient in adopting success methodology? Because they are more agile than the uh, police. Police are old bureaucrats. By their own admission in this anti-terrorist report, which I can give you a copy of, you can't find it. By their own admission, they are big bang waterfall building big bang waterfall systems. And I know because I'm, I am working with them and that is their big problem. They have a big bang waterfall culture. They're not agile, but the terrorists are agile. So the terrorists and the, the uh, not, not just terrorists, but of course, hackers, they're always many, you know, whatever countermeasure the police and governments do, the hackers adapt and find something new. So of course you must fight agility with better agility. <laughs> and they're fighting agility with stupid ancient bureaucracy. And they know that now, they've admitted it in writing. 
Cool, thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, just just while I'm uh, doing that, uh, I want to go to uh, let's see where is it. Uh, um, I was going to put the paper in. Ah, it's getting complex here with too many windows. Uh, if I write T E R R O R I S T, anti terrorist, anti terrorist. Yeah. I guess I don't have this. We, uh, we have to be careful here because it's recording, so. Yeah, okay, there's nothing confident. I, I was looking for the terrorist. Okay, so um, uh, again, if you want to read the paper written by the head of the uh, UK anti-terrorist uh, agency, uh, what they've learned the last 10 years, but I, I will give anybody the link who requests it. I was gonna try to put it in the chat, but it's too, it's, I would rather focus on the questions. So, sorry, Dennis, did you get an answer to your question at all? If not, please try again. <laughs> no, thank you. I got the question, yeah. Okay. Owais, Chowdhury, are you, where are you? In India or some nice place like that? Or un unmute your microphone. Uh, no, I'm in Russia. No, no, no. I was referring to O-W-A-I-S who has okay. his hand up. Okay. Uh, party. I'll tell you what. Until always gets his microphone working, Swati can ask. E, 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 they sound the same, uh, but it's okay. Yeah, I think I don't know how to pronounce, but maybe he's writing in the chat. I think he has some problem with. So uh, I right. can read out. Uh, good. Yeah. Okay. He's I'm asking. The chat. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. I can't turn on my microphone. Can you please turn it off? Admin can turn. Okay. Admin has to give him permission to turn on. I guess. So, uh, Manuel, maybe you can help. Otherwise, uh, always you can ask question on the chat. We are looking at it now. But in the meantime, Swati can go ahead. Um, I don't have any question for now, but um, just... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we are looking for either microphone for always or question in the chat. Yes, like, but we can, uh, you know, switch off our um, on and off our microphone. So. Maybe you can try to do that. But now he says he cannot do it in the chat. My question is about the graph at slide 30. Okay. Uh, <laughs> graph at slide 30. Help. I have too many windows here. Uh, failure curve. Ah, yes. Okay. I know which graph. Yes. Sorry. It's failure curve. They're good. Uh, yeah. What is the question about the failure curve? This is, by the way, um, something I picked up on the internet to symbolize gradual moving into failure, uh, unprofitable systems. What's the question? What is the question? Okay, failure curve. Sorry, it's failure curve. Yeah, right. Okay, I, I hope he's writing. In the meantime, anybody uh, we are five minutes into the 10 minute break. Ah, my 10 word question is good. Always. Uh, we don't know the future. How can we predict it's going to stay down? Okay. Now, by the way, how do the weather people predict the weather? How does any economist predict the future of an economy or corporation? Okay. Now, um, uh, the, 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 this, the simple answer is all prediction methods are based on knowledge of the past. But we also know it is dangerous because the future is not necessarily like the past. But if there is a curve going for 10 years in the same direction, one hypothesis is it will continue in the same direction. Maybe not, but until we have evidence otherwise, until the curve changes direction, we will predict it. So long story short, all estimates uh, of the future are based on knowledge of the past. Now, long-term prediction is notoriously difficult and we are very well aware of the problems and well aware that we can't do it. So um, what uh, Musk does and what I do is we use short-term prediction. That's why we have short one-day cycles, one-week cycles. It's so much easier to predict what will happen tomorrow 
and the next week, based on what happened today, than it is to predict what will happen next year. We know what we want next year. That's our goal, right? We know we are heading towards the goal. That's good. Uh, we know there is no deviation from the trajectory. So our hypothesis is we will probably reach the goal, but maybe not if something happens to change the trajectory. Okay. So I refer you to uh, any Google paper on prediction or estimation. So the problem is not new. It is thousands of years old uh, prediction and estimation. Okay. But uh, what the new thing is happening is we are, and it's not that new really, uh, we are focusing on prediction short term. And, uh, uh, but, but we are not, uh, but we, we, we have long term objectives and we have hypothesis that a consistent trajectory in the direction of the long term indicates we shouldn't change anything until further notice. Okay, but we are constantly measuring short, and the moment we see deviation from short term, we say, okay, hypothesis broken. Uh, and uh, we, we need to ask why and find the root cause and change the design and get back on the trajectory towards the long term goal. This is exactly the method of Musk and exactly my method. And it is also known as the scientific method, which is the last part of my lecture. Uh, okay for the moment, always. <laughs> any other, we're still looking at the chat, but uh, any other questions? Okay, could I ask a question, please? Yes, Constantine. Yeah, I was thinking, what uh, would you recommend to verify the metrics versus reality? I mean, uh, sometimes you could get a good numbers, but you're not sure whether it reflects the true situation. Now, your question is a little bit unclear. I'm not getting it all. Uh, try again, but 10 words or less. What's the key question? How we can understand that the metrics reflect the reality? Okay, good. Now, number one, uh, this is an old question for all scientists, engineers, and managers for thousands of years. So uh, you only have to Google um, prediction or estimates to find scientific papers and practical papers on the subject. In other words, I am not responsible for the answer. The answer is well known, okay? But, uh, but let me try to give some kind of answers. If you have a series of iterations every day and they're giving you consistent results, the cause and effect are working consistently according to your hypothesis, then you have some faith that it will continue until you get any measure of deviation from the path, okay? And the moment you get a measure of deviation one day, you analyze the root cause and try to understand why you got deviation. Now you have better understanding and maybe you can change or enhance your estimation or prediction model. Um, I mean, that's very roughly an answer, but I refer you to all science and scientific method, which I will lecture on in the last part of this, but uh, that, you know, so, so in other words, it's not a new problem for me or Elon Musk. It's a very old, well-known problem. And I hope uh, everybody understands that or can quickly understand it by Googling uh, uh, estimation methods or confidence in estimation. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, when I learned statistics as a young university student, I was learning about how to understand the data, you know, and uh, is the, the uh, uh, confidence intervals we had and things like that, okay? So much of the answer is in statistical analysis, for example, but not all of it. I hope that's Thank you very much. okay for the moment. Yeah. <laughs> we have, ah, we have done our 10 minute break. So I'll uh, go back. Yes, uh, I saw there was some problem with the microphone, but actually the, um, the participants are completely, uh, they, they, are, they have permission to unmute themselves. So, okay. There is not much I can okay, do. Okay, so now, uh,
when I'm finished with my lecture, I can stay on and take questions for those who want to, but I will formally end my lecture uh, on the hour, no matter what happens, okay? Okay, so uh, now let's see, uh, play. Are you seeing the change of slide? Yes. Good, okay, so I'm just checking it's working. Okay, so um, uh, I, now if we're gonna deal with uh, complex systems, which means a system within a system within a system, uh, sometimes called systems of systems, then rigorous engineering is not an option, it is a necessity, okay? And uh, in, in, in a sense, if you're doing very simple systems, like I'm programming something this week for a friend, you do not need rigorous engineering. But if you're building a system for uh, Russian uh, distribution of Sputnik vaccine, then I think you need rigorous engineering to make it work better. It's just a big complex system. Here's a lovely illustration of a system of systems in a modern car. Um, uh, here, by the way, is my new red Tesla. Uh, took it over 21st of September. There's my wife and I outside my son's house, actually, in Norway. But now, and again, as it says down here, the details are often invisible to the driver. So you cannot see how advanced this car is. Okay, but it does have all these subsystems and all of these subsystems need to interact with very many of the other subsystems. So here's a, you know, so clearly very good engineering uh, of these modules is necessary. So it works together. So the driver does, isn't worried about it. It just works. You can drive it and you get your final result of all of this, uh, for example, automatic braking, adaptive cruise control, adaptive front lighting, airbag deport. This is all safety, right? They're all the bottom line is, you won't crash probably, but if you do, you will survive. That's it. That's the bottom line for all of this. Okay. So um, now you. Here's another idea. There are so many things to worry about. You cannot worry about everything directly. That is, you cannot design a solution to everything that can happen with a car. You cannot identify everything that can happen with a car. Look at the struggle for self-driving systems and the artificial intelligence. There are whole videos presenting Tesla artificial intelligence struggle for the Tesla right now. And it's, it's quite clear that the quantity of problems is uh, mind boggling. Nobody can ever get there. They can't train the system on known events. There are too many unknown events. Okay, now, so the, what is the solution? And the solution is you can worry indirectly. What does that mean? Well, uh, I believe you can design systems so that unknown problems are handled. Okay, now here's a very simple example. In old style uh, uh, software engineering, defect prevention, sorry, not, uh, sorry. Uh, 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 here we are releasing the software for test. And then we find a whole lot of bugs and we fix them. And then we, we get down to a low bug level and we release to field and we still find some bugs. Now this is old style thinking. New style thinking, which we started doing 10 or 20 years ago, with things called defect prevention processes at IBM, link right there. What they do is they try to discover the defects, the unclear requirements in the requirement stage, the unclear and bad design in the design stage, and they fix it there, okay? And what it means is the defects that would have shown up here do not show up and even defects we could not have imagined will be caught because we have done the general defect prevention for uh, very many classes of defects, okay? And I can make a long list of things you can do to design systems 
to capture problems you didn't even know you were going to have. Like, uh, give another example. I'll just say the words, you can look it up, distinct software. I've written many papers on it, so have other people. Triple redundant uh, software is a good example of something to handle problems. So it's even more advanced than this. This is handling the problem at the level of specification of the system. Triple redundancy is building in detection mechanisms in the system to, if you like, capture a bug and fix it automatically. It's a form of automation. This is finding and fixing a bug manually, okay? So long story short, advanced engineering is preventing defects from happening. And in addition, designing the system to tackle problems that you didn't even know about and could not know about. Okay, and this is possible if you are conscious of the idea and you ask questions, give me some examples of design, uh, architecting systems to handle problems that we don't even know about today. Okay, right. Now, architecture of a system is only limited by constraints. So if you, if you say, the architecture must be legal, for example, for privacy, GDPR laws, in the European Union, that is a constraint and architecture cannot uh, share everybody's information with everybody in the world to earn a profit, so it's limited. But an architect can observe a constraint and seek to relax the constraint temporarily or permanently and seek to remove the constraint. In other words, a constraint is not absolute and forever. And it's important that architects uh, rec uh, recognize that. Um, here's a little uh, picture. Uh, here are some value requirements for a stakeholder. And these are absolutely necessary, but maybe somebody gave you a budget, say one uh, billion rubles, okay? And uh, uh, that seems like a constraint, but you discover some fantastic engineering you can do to make the system best in the whole world, but it will cost 10 times as much. So you have to go back to your board of directors and say, I have a constraint, 1 billion rubles. Give me 10 billion rubles and I will solve the hunger program on the planet. And Mr. Musk says, no problem. I'll sell a little bit of my Tesla shares and give you 10 billion rubles if you promise to solve the hunger problem on the planet, okay? So that's relaxing a constraint, in this case, the constraint of the budget, okay? Now, here's another view of it. Here's this impact estimation table. Um, uh, this is from a book I've written, I call C uh, System Enterprise Architecture, and uh, hopefully you will find a free copy of it somewhere, but it's my book for the architects. Anyway, uh, here is in fact the United Nations goals, uh, goal number one, end poverty, goal number two, end hunger. Here are some strategies, uh, and uh, the strategies for ending poverty, the strategies for ending hug hunger, et cetera. And in the impact estimation table, we're saying, well, okay, the strategies we have listed for ending poverty, how effective are they? And here we have said they are 95% effective in reaching our goal, which is this number here by this date, et cetera, on the scale of measure. So not surprisingly, the strategies for ending poverty are very effective for ending poverty. Well, that's nice. Now, we're going to ask a question which engineers call side effects. And we're going to ask another question called costs. And so, uh, fine, but what, what does this end, the end poverty strategies do for end hunger and for healthy lives and for quality of education? And the answer is, well, actually, it solves 42% of the end hunger. Wow, that's a nice side effect. What does it do for healthy lives? Sorry, negative side effect, minus 42%. It gets worse. It's destructive. By the way, if you want a model of this, since you're Russians largely, think of a chess move and think of all the different things that a chess move does. And that's what this <coughs> impact estimation table is doing. It's helping you see the consequences of a move, 
This is a move, a strategy you can implement. What does it do for this? Well, a little bit, not much. What does it do for gender equality? Ah, negative. What does it do for water and sanitation? We don't know, we haven't estimated. Maybe it's very bad, maybe it's very good. We don't know, a known unknown. Confucius say, wise to find known and unknowns, to know what you don't know. Um, also, I think Plato said the same thing some centuries later. Okay, by the way, what does it cost? Oh, 25% of my budget. Hmm. I guess I, I need 10 different strategies for, the, actually there are 17 different goals at the United Nations. So one of my strategies, one of 17, you might say, cost 25% of my budget. Hmm, not good. <laughs> because then I'm going to exceed my budget using the other 16 strategies also cost 25%. I'm going to run out of budget very quickly. Okay. By the way, I hope this is giving you a little picture of how the impact estimation table is used to en enhance your ability to think and communicate about a complex set of strategies for a complex set of requirements and complex set of constraints or budgets. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, organizational consequences for systems to succeed. Uh, Musk is very, very, very clear. I need the world's top experts, the best in the world, the number one, and I will find them, I will motivate them, I will pay them, and I'll give them a fantastic working environment so they can change the world and if, if they buy into my vision of saving the human race on Mars, okay, or whatever. And so, uh, but he puts them into teams together called a pod, maybe six specialists, whether it's in production of a car or developing a rocket, doesn't matter. And, uh, and then the specialists work cross-functional. They work together as a team, helping each other to achieve the goal uh, the, the requirements, if you like, uh, numeric, measurable requirements of the pod. That's how he or organizes uh, things. Let's see. Um, so uh, narrow silo thinking threatens your success. So, for example, uh, the anti-terrorist activities in the United Kingdom, uh, that's what they said. We are doing narrow silo thinking, like uh, the police database is the important thing and they ignored 10 other kinds of databases in the United Kingdom that would give them information about terrorists. That's called silo thinking. And they said that threatens our success in identifying the terrorists before they bomb the concert locale, which you know about in Russia, right? Or France, okay? So here's a little silo mentality. Uh, oh, we have a great police database. <laughs> See, here's another one saying, what we're learning about a student who doesn't attend the lessons and studies the Quran every day uh, might be interesting. Maybe he's being converted into a terrorist, hmm. but that information doesn't get to the police. Hmm. Ah, violation of privacy and religion, <laughs> difficult stuff. So um, here I have a little uh, set of things again. I don't have time to go through it, but you can go back to it. It's what I call principles of systems engineering thinking. So by systems engineering, we are rejecting the silo and saying we need to look at the whole system, all components, all elements, all of the environment in which it operates, all of the stakeholders, all of the 50 stakeholders with all of their 100 critical requirements. Everything must be looked at, including the changes in the future where the terrorists have new uh, tactics, okay? So system thinking is looking at everything. And the current paradigms for, for example, IT, let's call them scrum and safe, just to give you a concrete picture. These are not very good at systems engineering thinking. In fact, they are totally wasted and you can throw them all away and start again. But systems thinking exists if you go to INCOSE, International Council on Systems Engineering.org, 
you will find the systems engineering organization, which I have been a member of for 25 years. And they are largely military and space, but also any very large complex organizations. And they publish handbooks of knowledge of systems engineering, where my methods are quoted, by the way. And I've been trying to influence them for 25 years. But principles of systems engineering start with stakeholders, and they have clear, unambiguous, measurable, testable requirements. They do systematic architecture, see my systems engineering enterprise architecture book. And then they deliver in small implementable increments like Musk and I do, testing and measuring and learning. And in a nutshell, <clears throat> that's what I'm calling systems engineering. And it's, uh, it, it, now Musk actually does um, a very advanced form of Scrum, okay? There's a book by Joe Justice, which I highly recommend. It's called, um, uh, let's see, uh, Ad, is it Agile Scrum or Scrum Agile? Doesn't matter. And he, he has worked at Tesla and at Volkswagen and at Amazon and at with Bill Gates. And he, he has this very advanced Scrum method, which is Scrum engineering, you could say. Okay, in other words, there is a, an agile cycle of managing change, but it's got a measurement all over the place. It's got recognition of multiple stakeholders all over the place. So it's not the simple Scrum of programming that is taught by the Scrum Alliance, but it is the Scrum of Elon Musk and the Scrum of my Evo method, which Jeff Sutherland credits as being part of his inspiration for Scrum, okay? So uh, uh, simple Scrum is good for simple projects. You need advanced Scrum, the agile Scrum of Joe Justice, uh, which is what Tesla is in fact using, okay? And it is engineering methods. Um, at, uh, this is what I found about 3.30 last night. <laughs> I, uh, I I'd been listening to a lecture and, uh, on the internet a few days, a couple days ago, and this fellow here, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Paul Ralph, was mentioned very quickly. So I looked up Paul Ralph, you'll find him there, and uh, I emailed him and he replied back. And I got access to uh, all of his good stuff. And I found a, a paper on the dimensions of software engineering success. And of course, that is my subject I've just been dealing with. And I took a look at what he had. You know, this is basically an academic study with, I think, 83 different IT people being interviewed. Uh, so it reflects, you might say, conventional thinking of IT. But I quite liked what I saw. I thought it was pretty good. See, it says here, these are the five dimensions of software engineering success. And stakeholders is in there, not users and, and customers. Efficiency, okay, uh, like I was talking about, the value to cost relationship. Artifact quality, you know, the, the maintainability I was talking about and stability and things, wonderful. Market performance. Are you selling the cars and time? So I thought, wow, for whatever reason, I quite like the framework they arrived at that, that is recognized. So I would, uh, I, no, I just did a quick and not thorough reading last night at 3.30, but uh, I, I, I think this paper has nailed it. This has got a pretty good understanding of dimensions of software engineering success. And uh, again, it's an academic study and you're an academic institution. So you might uh, like the academic study. And I hope to keep, con I've got contact now with Paul Ralph. I sent a copy about 3.30 in the morning to Paul Kelly. They're both at Lancaster University in the UK. But, uh, uh, and uh, much of what uh, Paul uh, Ralph has written earlier about requirements and other things is very good stuff, but there's a complete list of all his things um, there. There, okay. Okay. 
yeah, that was not the intent. I've just a moment. There we go. Uh, shit. Okay. Uh, let's see. Can anybody hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yes. Hear you. Okay, good. Now, uh, if I didn't completely lose control of Zoom, but I have uh, stop share, resume share. Okay, you are screen sharing. That's good to hear. I, lo I lost my the image. <laughs> um, okay, we're back. <laughs> now. All right, uh, there. Okay, now I'm, uh, I've got, uh, we're on time, remarkably enough, probably used about 73 minutes and we're on slide 73. So my third section is science. Uh, I, uh, I, I believe that the use of scientific methods in addition to the use of engineering methods is the key to success in complex projects. And so I'm quite simply going to point to things that I do and recommend in my competitive engineering and say, this is a, also a major principle in science, okay? So my assertion or hypothesis is uh, science methods uh, uh, can improve your results and your success. So first, we look at a little uh, a conventional diagram of the scientific method, okay? This is just one nice one of many I've found on the internet. And we compare it to the Guild cycle, which by the way is uh, the same as the plan, do, study, act cycle of Deming and Schuert, PDSA, okay? The statistical process control cycle, same thing. Uh, okay, and this idea that you go in a cycle of learning and testing and analyzing data, that is a scientific idea. Sorry, could you say that again? <laughs> Siri. Uh, okay, so that is essentially what the major idea, the major idea for success I said was go in rapid, short cycles of measuring, learning, interacting with stakeholders and their values, okay? So another thing I did, I've mentioned several times, is what is the source, okay? Now, here's an example of uh, uh, source for a, uh, an exercise where we have a design called T-Kiosk for user productivity. This is a detailed window for the impact estimation table. We have an impact, save seven minutes. We have some evidence but we also have a source, which is a, a link to the T kiosk strategy and how it's used. So that's an example of giving source for the estimation. Now we had a, a question earlier, how do you know that your estimation is good? And what I said was uh, the, the answer, oopsie. The answer is past history. So this is past history indicates that, um, if the future of this method is anything like the past of the method, then the result will be a saving of seven minutes, plus or minus three. Okay, this is impact estimation detail. Okay, but I'm, I'm, I demand evidence. Not only do I demand evidence, but I use the evidence and the source to uh, uh, um, assign a credibility level Credibility level one is this is perfectly true and you can be sure this will be right. Credibility level zero is this is a scientific wild ass guess. That's engineering language called swag. And it's a random number and it's worth nothing. Okay. So that impact estimation table is built up. If it's a 10 by 10 table, there are 100 such cells where we look at, we insist on evidence, we insist on sources, we look at the credibility, we look at the plus minus uncertainty, and we have a better idea of what will happen in the future. So this is a more detailed answer to the question of uh, estimation. Uh, and it's not, it's called impact estimation table for a reason, we estimate. 
Here's uh, another one. Uh, here is an ambition level uh, for a, a client of mine. And uh, his ambition for his new company is this wonderful bullshit management bullshit here. But I know that Steve Tendon on this date is the one who said this. Okay. So I, I, I don't have to wonder where did this management bullshit come from? I can go back to my friend Steve and say, Steve, you said this. Now, this is bullshit. What do you mean by high performance? What do you mean by alternative? Which market are you talking about? What the hell is contemporary management? And what is a contemporary management approach? Uh, in, other words, in other words, this is just management bullshit. Let's work on it, Steve, which we do, and quantify the ambition with scales of measure and numbers. But I know who to talk to because I know who the source is. So long, now, as you all know, you look at the end of, for example, any of uh, um, Mr. Uh, uh, Paul Ralph's papers, you will find 45 to 90 references or sources of what he's doing. Here are the, the references to the references right here all the way through. It wouldn't be a scientific paper without lots of references. Okay, so I'm claiming we use the same practice all over the place as a practical everyday matter in language. Now, if you say my strategy or my technology is great, and you say, fine, I, I say to you, give me evidence, but you say, I cannot give you evidence. I believe it will make America great again, or something like that. Then I say, you are on the path to failure. You do not know, in a scientific sense, what is true. You have a belief in a religious sense what you believe. Now, your belief can be correct, but science says beliefs are dangerous. Musk says you must understand that your requirements and designs are wrong. That is your initial belief. You must not believe they're right because they're given by people in authority. I go back to the beginning of the lecture here. You must challenge them and test them and measure them and look for, uh, for good evidence, okay? Uh, so here, uh, evidence. I, I showed you a moment ago this a scale of measure for credibility. This is in the competitive engineering book. We uh, in invented the method for Medtronic in Minnesota that delivers pacemakers. Three months later, Medtronic came and said, this method is worth $1 million. We used your method and we got $1 million more than anybody else got for our uh, projects for the next year's research and development. So that's how much it's worth, $1 million dollars to think about credibility and make sure that your proposals to management asking for a million rubles, million dollars are credible, highly credible. Okay, if your proposal has wild guess or we only we know it's been done somewhere but we don't know what happened and we don't know where, then you have low credibility, you are wasting your time, Elon Musk will not give you six billion dollars to solve the hunger problem. That's exactly what's happening right now. Okay, here's a wonderful recent quotation uh, about evidence, you know, ignoring evidence leads to avoidable harm and failing to admit our uncertainties means, means we don't get better evidence. So I like that quote a lot. Uh, here's a richer picture of the scientific method cycle, uh, far too detailed to go, in, but I like the richness of the picture, picture uh, but it is the same as the guild cycle. It's the same as the, uh, the, but it's about gathering data, interpreting the data and learning, learning, learning to get better benefits and outcomes. Now, uh, uh, after I write down a scale in a requirement, I have a language concept called a meter. And meter is like ther thermometer, uh, spectrometer, voltmeter. In other words, a measuring instrument. And meter is simply a plan or specification. You might call it a test plan. And we can have one or more meters to operate on any given scale of measure. And in large scale systems, we need to architect, engineer, or design a meter 
to have certain quality characteristics like uh, accuracy and repeatability at low cost, like setup and acquisition. And what you need is a meter adequate for purpose, not a perfect meter. And you need the, the cheapest meter that is adequate for purpose so you don't spend unnecessarily time and money. Notice that one of Musk's principles went in the optimization principles uh, said that it's very important to remove early meters in early processes once the overall process is working correctly. In other words, the meter he put in in sub-processes had too high an overhead for long-term use. They, only, they, they were good enough for temporary use while they were learning to master the process of firing up a rocket. But once that was working every time, they would focus on things like, did the rocket get to the International Space Station or not? And they take away the metering, which cost weight on the, for example, the uh, uh, rocket and would prevent the rocket having the distance it should have. So, I, okay. Anyway, long story short uh, about meter. Uh, here uh, we have some uh, 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 goals being set, some requirements. Here we have a meter step by step measuring progress of a real system. Now we can see that the trajectory of this, we will not reach this objective. I mean, th this is not going up there, this is going there. So here we say, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, at the rate we're going, we will not meet the minimum tolerable level for July. So we must radically re-engineer, or we must tell people we are not going to meet this criteria. Okay. Actually, the trajectory is good enough to say we'll probably meet a planned level for October, but we will not meet critical early levels, which we need to do something. Okay. So here we are, uh, here by the way, is an example of a specification of a meter. For uh, a meter is what measures a long a scale. And in simple terms, you can call it a uh, test plan. We need to visualize the value and cost relations in multiple dimensions. And so here are some visualizations here is a visualization of the uh, total value over many values and total costs over many costs of the uh, strategy for end poverty for the uh, United Nations uh, 17 objectives. Okay, so I can visualize, I, what, I'm also visualizing that there are no estimates for any of the other strategies. So we only have estimates for the first two strategies. And, uh, uh, but, uh, and, and they are very roughly equal in value to cost, whatever that means, okay? Here's another visualization, uh, the disaster protection for poverty, that's also United Nations goal, uh, goal one. Uh, here is where we uh, are, and I'm visualizing here is uh, early goals later goals, stretch goals, and one status goal. And we can look at the details of any of these. Here's more visualization. Here's the visualization I showed for, this is actually a sub-strategy for, uh, um, uh, and I think it's ending poverty. And this is the impact, and we're visualizing the degree of impact on this goal. And here we are visualizing the cost of this strategy on this cost. Okay. Here, we are visualizing the hierarchy of architecture. Light bulb means bright idea. And here, we're visualizing the set of values. These are the 17 United Nations values. For the, so I just wanted to show you some ideas of visualization. These are all built into the Valplan tool, but uh, certainly these things, these things you can do with a spreadsheet. We've been doing that for 50 years. And uh, yeah, these things you could do with maybe Miro or some other graphical uh, 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 tool. Another, uh, but uh, so what I'm saying is a scientific practice to try to visualize what's happening scientifically. Um, doing on time, pretty good. 
Now, one, one thing that science tries to do is to have clear definitions. I take a very simple example. What is a volt? What is an ampere? What is a kilo? Well, these are internationally scientifically defined. Uh, the, the, the definition is sometimes refined when we get better techniques for defining a kilo using vibration properties of matter rather than uh, simpler methods from Napoleonic times, okay? Uh, but uh, so definition of concepts is very important. And what I've found in uh, the, uh, for example, software engineering field, uh, even in the work of Paul Ralph, by the way, is a, a lack of good definition of concepts. And he discusses this too. Um, so, but uh, now in language, I have defined over 700 basic concepts in Planguage and published them for free download. You'll find them in the competitive engineering book. And I've defined concepts like goal, ambition, scale, meter. And I've given a very good stable definition, which has lasted for several decades. And my definitions know about every other definition. They're not isolated, sub-optimized definitions, which is another problem. So, uh, uh, so uh, by the way, I have 700 defined concepts. And then in language, when defining, for example, the end of poverty goal, I define that rigorously with maybe 20 different parameters, right? And... Um, uh, so, uh, in addition to the standard Planguage definitions, I define in Planguage uh, the other thing. That's exactly what science does. It has some well-defined things like ampere and volt and kilo, and then <coughs> for the problem at hand, like getting a spaceship to Mars, they define additional things. Um, uh, another thing I've done is I focus on defining the concept, and then I allocate my preferred English name to it. And then I can define a uh, Russian name for it. And then I can give it a number. And then I can give it a synonym, an acronym. And then I can give it a graphical symbol called an icon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, these are pointers to the same concept. And the, now I've got a whole uh, paper on how I've done my glossary there. So if you're interested in the idea of defining concepts and using concepts I've done here, uh, I recommend that paper, which I did for INCOSI 2007. Another scientific habit is equations to keep track of multiple dimensions. So here's a set of uh, actually equations. These are equations from the impact estimation table leading to certain uh, uh, concepts or ideas. Here is the table where we have a simple equation saying the, the sum of the impacts of different uh, uh, strategies uh, can be summarized. So I have an overall impact of if I do all four strategies. Okay. I can also sum the impacts on multiple dimensions in this direction, and I get the sum of the values. I can also compute the values with multiple values over the uh, sum of resources and get a value to cost ratio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So the impact estimation table is filled with equations, which you can then plug into any spreadsheet or use the Val Plan app, and it will automatically do those equations for you and even convert those directly into, for example, bar chart visualizations. Or here, there's a visualization. It actually says we've reached the, the engineering safety factor of factor two. And here we have not, it's under two. Therefore, there is not enough design to reach the safety factor. And we're visualizing that by computing a number, uh, saying it's under the safety factor of 200 or factor two and giving a red signal saying your design is incomplete and it's not safe to start uh, under, to try to understand the cost because you don't even have enough strategies 
and the new or different strategies will cost more money, so you don't actually know what it's going to cost. Therefore, you can't even ask for a budget at this point. I hope that was not too much for the more brilliant students here. Uh, and, and now I've got a set of uh, laws, just for fun, Guild's Laws of Project Success. And uh, I'll only go through one of them. And I joke a little bit because scientific laws have this scientific property that they are, uh, you know, Newton's laws can be challenged by Einstein and Einstein's laws can be challenged by later scientists. So a law doesn't mean it's, it's true, but it means that uh, it's incredibly true in very many circumstances and nobody has proven it is not yet. So it's a law until proven untrue in given circumstances. So just for fun, I've got Guild's laws of project success. And my first law of that is if you have not defined success, your value requirements, clearly, that means quantitatively, then it is impossible to get success, to reach the successful levels, because you don't even know what they are. And no architect can architect towards them. No project manager can say, am I going in the right direction, et cetera. So, uh, uh, and if I had more time, which I don't, I've got six minutes left, I would go through these, but I believe I have also, this is actually a summary of the talk, but so five minutes to round off, yeah. So, uh, but just for fun, Guild's laws of project success, is, these are the things I'm trying to talk about in this lecture. There's something called the ethics of success, and ethics is, uh, what if you succeed, but you are lying to your customers, like Volkswagen lied to their customers and the, the um, combustion testing agencies about their pollution. Very embarrassing, and it costs them a lot of money. So uh, uh, Volkswagen was not an ethical company. And there are lots of companies that are not ethical for you know, all kinds of uh, reasons. Politicians lie corporate directors lie, but some don't. For example, I think Musk is ethical. I've not caught him lying yet. I believe he wants the truth. Good scientists want the truth. Good scientists are ethical, okay? So I invite you to consider uh, ethics as a possibility. And if you're gonna lie, I hope you have a very good reason, like it will save a million lives would be a good reason for lying, okay? And there are occasions in history of doing this. For example, Truman's decision to bomb Hiroshima is horrible, but he was trying to save 1 million soldiers' lives, which is the cost of invading Japan. And so, yeah, he killed uh, a, a lot of innocent, nice Japanese. And he, you know, uh, and he he lied about certain things in that connection, like uh, he didn't tell the Japanese that they had such an atomic bomb and they were going to drop it. Uh, okay, there's a whole history there. So there's a history of uh, uh, good lies, which may be ethical. <laughs> Lying itself is not unethical. Hiding the truth might be ethical, but be careful. Volkswagen did not lie ethically about their combustion of the real combustion. Okay, so I hope the university is teaching ethics and teaching how to apply ethics in practice. Language is a method that can help you to be ethical. Okay, long story short. Uh, I met a professor uh, in Poland a couple of years ago, there he is, Samir, and we were having a beer and he told me that he's, he wrote a paper on uh, the, uh, uh, the, the general theory of design, how it would look. And I said, tell me more. And he told me more over the beer. And I said, you know what? I think I have all the components necessary to have a general theory of design. And I will write a paper on that. So I did. And there is my paper. Okay, and he said, I will help you uh, clean up the paper for academic purposes and get it published. I'm actually the editor of it. So we're, he's still promising to do it and he hasn't done it yet. 
So if somebody else would like to help me work, this could be your doctoral thesis, the general grand design theory, and you can work with me and we will clean it up and we'll get the, uh, the general theory of design. I've already got 95% of it. I just need some hard work. I'm not willing to do the hard academic work to do it, but I'm willing to let somebody work with me to do the hard academic work. And then uh, you can be uh, a co-author of the first grand theory of design. Isn't that fun academic challenge? Let me know if you're up for it. So that's the general theory of design. And now I've got one more minute. Uh, so I can just show you a little bit. Uh, this is practical experience at Intel, but it's almost a scientific research paper about how they got 500 times better at the quality of their requirements using Guild's methods. So that's practical proof of my measures. Uh, I also uh, like the idea of standards uh, in science, like a standard of a volt or a meter. And I have lots of standards. And my good friend Leonardo da Vinci understands the idea of standards are the fruit of sound experience. And there are masses of standards, which are my experience in the competitive engineering book. And references are a very good idea. Here are, uh, and I'm ending the talk right here. Here are the references and in the references are further references. And now I'm done with my talk exactly on time. And I did it using my methods. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Tom. I think that if there are some questions, uh, we can uh, we can take them now. This is the good, um, I think, as a good occasion. Yes. Or or, or also later, you, there is your address. I mean, you shared already your address. Yes. But, yes. Um, probably this is a good time. I would like to ask something. Uh, can yes, I? Please. Hi, Tom. It's Samna. Thank you very much for the amazing lecture. I, I have two questions and maybe they are a little bit general, but first I would like to know based upon your experience, what is the thing that people are practicing widely in the domain of requirements engineering and you feel that it is absolutely detrimental and should be completely removed? Uh, okay. This is the first question. And okay. the second- No, no, second no, no. Question. One, one question at a time, Hamna. Let me deal with your first question, okay? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Now, I have a book which I will supply to those of you who ask, but you will find a reference to it in some of the references there. It's called uh, uh, um, Value Requirements, okay? Sure, yeah. And my answer is in chapter 15 of the book. And I tackle, for example, you have uh, requirements called use cases. You have requirements called user stories. You have requirements called OKR, ob objectives and key requirements, okay, et cetera. These are conventional widespread requirements practices. And I explain in my book why they are good practices for small limited systems and explain why they are bad practices for large complex systems. Okay, by the way, if you Google my name, Tom Guild, and you, and, and you uh, uh, Google what's wrong with user stories, what's wrong with OKR, you will get papers on this subject by me. Now, I'll give you the general answer. These requirement ideas are not quantified, for example, user stories, use cases, or in the case of OKR, they're not quantified well enough for large scale use. And for example, in both of the cases, user stories and OKR, I have 12 different reasons why these methods are not good enough. In, de so I, in detail, I argue the case and I show that Planguage does not have these problems and Planguage is a, a better requirements language for large scale systems. Uh, so that's the short answer. And Hamna, if you send me an email, I will send you one copy of 
value requirements, which you can then send the link to all your fellow students. All right, thank you very much. Um, actually, you already answered my second question also because it was about uh, like in, in your lecture, you were saying that you do not like scrum practices. Um, and I wanted to ask like, uh, I understand that they avoid the system view, but I do not see any other way. Like if yeah. we do not break down it into components, okay. it becomes difficult now, to understand if features. You refer back, you notice what I said, I referred to the book by Joe Justice called Agile Scrum or Scrum Agile. Yeah. That is Scrum like I'm talking about. I call it Agile as it should be. It is the Agile practice by Elon Musk, okay? Now, so there, in other words, the problem is Scrum is, as you know, a framework and it is consciously lacking a great deal of many other practices. That, that, that's what SAFE, the Agile method is trying to do is supply all the additional practices, okay? Now, so the problem with pure Scrum, uh, as uh, most people learn, is it doesn't have the additional practices. You know, it doesn't have engineering. It doesn't have science. It doesn't have design and architecture at all. Okay, so that's why Scrum doesn't work on a large scale. It works on a small scale. All of these methods work on a small scale. Okay, but the problem I'm trying to solve is we have everybody you don't go to a university like yours to learn to solve trivial small scale problems. You go to the university to solve the problems of the whole health system of Russia, or maybe the international United Nations curing poverty, okay? These are big complex systems and they require engineering. So long story short, I don't like the popular simple methods because they're not good enough for the real complex systems we have, they're not good enough for engineering, and they're not enough people who point that out and say, hey, for the project you're doing, you need to engineering, and you're not even thinking about it or training people in it. Okay, Hamna? Yes, thank you very much. I will read the material you will send, share with me. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Pleasure. Questions are welcome. If any question, I don't see. I, I have a question. Please. Let's begin. Um, so do you have a roadmap to get proficient in uh, the methods that you described? Yes. Will um, you be able to share that? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, now, uh, I would prefer to answer this by, uh, you send me an email, Dennis. Definitely. Okay. And it simply says, I want the roadmap for getting proficient in the methods. Okay. Well, I, I'll say more. And, and, and then questions. I will send you the roadmap and you may share it with everybody. Okay. Okay. Now I'm not, I don't want everybody here to send me the email. Dennis will get it. Now I'll okay. give you some idea. The th thing you do not do is read my competitive engineering book, which has at least 500 ideas and say, we will implement them in our organization tomorrow. That would be stupid. Generally speaking, the roadmap starts with something you can do today. And I will tell you how I start today with my real clients. I start by saying, today, we will define your top 10 critical objectives quantitatively. And that's all we are going to do today. And we do it today. I do this all the time with my real clients and with my students. I don't discuss design. I don't discuss project management with them. I just say uh, that there's one thing we can do and we can do it today. We can identify our top 10 critical goals. We can quantify them by parallel teams working for two hours. And at five o'clock today, we have got quantified goals. That's how I start one incremental step at a time. And then they say, what's the next step, Tom? I say, tomorrow we will let the architects find the architecture and put it on an impact estimation table. And we will see how it meets our top 10 goals we did yesterday. And I do that. I have a, uh, a case study 
for Persinscom, US Department of Defense, where we do the whole method of planning this way in one week, one step every day. So I'm gonna send you the Persinscom. You will probably find that uh, uh, case study, but it's interesting because it's US Department of Defense and we dive in and we do it from scratch one day, one day, one day, one day. That's how I do it. So long story short, and this is what Musk does. He didn't just dine, dive in with his current methods. He spent 20 years refining his methods and he's still learning to mass produce cheap cars, right? But his journey is very clear. It is every day, he, he tells his pods, his teams, you at the end of the day, you will suggest what you could do better for your team process and for your product. And you will suggest simple things that can be done today. And you will do them. And you have the budget to do them and the power to do them. And I don't want to hear anything except you tried to do them even if you failed. Okay? That's the method. Continuous improvement, it's called. Kaizen, the Japanese have always called it. It's my evolutionary method, I've called it for decades. Okay? Okay, so that's the answer. You need to evolutionarily uh, uh, identify and test high priority methods, make them work, and then when they're working fine, move on to the next. And you can do this, Musk does this with maybe hundreds of parallel teams. You know, maybe 200 at Tesla and 100 at SpaceX. He's doing exactly this. The, the teams are learning and teaching the organization. So short answer, one step at a time. Thank you, yeah, because I wanted to focus on that. Um, because you presented so many cool things and some of them are very complex. Right. But your answer is clar like, it clarified everything. So. Let me warn you about something. Um, the one of the people I wrote a forward to my book, his name is Roger Pressman. And Roger Pressman is the best selling author of everything on software engineering in the United States. You can look him up. Many years ago, he read, read my book manuscript for principles of software engineering management. In other words, 1985. And he told me, he said, Tom, I began reading your manuscript after you gave it to me at my home. And he said, it was very slow reading. I needed one hour per page because you have 10 ideas per page and each idea requires thought and consideration, okay? And uh, this is unfortunate truth about Tom Gilp. He has 10 ideas per page. You try counting them. Take a random page in competitive engineering and take a look, okay? And why is this? Well, uh, if I didn't write my 500 page with 10 ideas per page, and I had only one idea per page, then I'd have to write a 5,000 page book. And I don't want to write a 5,000 page book. I've got other things to do. So I put the problem, the monkey on your back. I gave the problem to you, how to decode guilt. But I'll give you a clue. Uh, one of uh, people uh, at Graph Metrics, Frederick Gibson, he's an architect. And he's doing extremely advanced technology that I'm involved in now. Um, and he has read my book, Competitive Engineering, nine times. And he's serious. So maybe you have to read my book nine times if you're a very smart guy to get it. Or read one page and take an hour or a day to absorb it. Tough luck. Life is like that. You're all smart people. You can do it. And if you're smart, you will do it, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, thank you very much. I'm still waiting if there is more, any more question. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. Please. Patrick? Yes, uh, thank you for such uh, an, an amazing talk. So I, I wanted to, you talk about uh, stakeholders, which is when building a project. Uh, sometimes the wish can be like some kind of ethical recommendation and uh, we should, do you, do you think that we should already prioritize the profit 
if they if complying with the ethical aspect of the product that we are trying to book will be uh, would cost us a lot. Okay, I think I got your question, but can I ask you for ten words or less? Yes. So for ten words, what is the position of ethical uh, aspect of the project that you are building, comparison to the profit? Ah, okay. Profit and ethics. Yeah. Okay. Now, ethics is something that has to be decided locally. Okay. Uh, the ethics of Norwegians would be different from the ethics of Russians. Okay, yes. it's, that's the way. That's culture. It's called, and that's uh, not good or bad. It's just it's different. And the 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 ethics of a um, one type of business in Norway compared to say a university research lab in Norway on public health would be different. Okay, so each organization has to choose its ethics and try to make them happen. Now, ethics will always be in conflict with profit. You can always earn more profit in the short term by violating ethics. So Volkswagen did it with their cars, right? But there's a problem. Uh, in the long term, when people discover you are cheating them, you may lose far more profit than you ever earned in the short term. So one reason for ethics is it probably is the most profitable thing to do in the long term. And now if you're willing to say, I don't care about the long term, I'm gonna earn a lot of money and run and buy Chelsea or something like that. I'm gonna become a Russian oligarch. Well, go ahead, okay? And people do that. But the in the long term, unethical practices have a penalty. And uh, so uh, uh, bad ethics is usually short-term thinking. And some people do that intentionally. And uh, good ethics is long-term uh, thinking. My short answer. Okay, thank you so much. I think it's pretty much clear. Then it depends how long and short it is. Eh? Because like Keynes said, in the long run, we'll all be dead. So some people think the short run could be in the <laughs> long run. In the long run, my ancestors, children, and grandchildren will be alive. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, this I is am already... now eighty years old, and what I am writing, it will not become popular and widespread until after I die. And I'm hoping that some of you will be the people that bring it into the future generations. For sure, we are here also for this. Uh, I think it was a very informative uh, uh, lecture. I would call it event, but it's it's a lecture. We can of course uh, repeat it for uh, for the same group. Uh, I mean, if you have more material for another group, maybe next semester, or when you prefer. Of course, we are very very keen to listen more from you. If okay, there is no the, other... the answer is yes, as long as I'm alive. <laughs> yes, of course. of course, yes. Of well, yes, we 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 believe so. So uh, your, if you don't mind, your slides will be uh, shared locally yeah. only to our students. I mean, there is an internal uh, system Moodle. Yeah, no, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, one, the slides can be shared uh, uh, anywhere in your university. Mm -hmm. I. I, I I think I can say the slides could be made public on the internet. In other words, you can put it up on LinkedIn or Twitter if you like. It's okay with me. Okay. For what concerns this recording, uh, that it, it's uh, going to be recorded in the cloud by Zoom. If you don't mind, I will share the link to, to the class or to the of course. And again, I'm very happy if my uh, lecture videos are made public because the ideas get out to other people. So YouTube is okay for this? Yes, okay. no secrets. <laughs> Thank you. There is one more question I see, please. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes. We hear something. <laughs> yes, my name And is I also see Awais and Anton have their hands up. So yeah, let's, let's I'll see. put the chat on. So my name is Awais. I, I was previously logged in for myself when I, and there was some problem. By the way, your, your volume is extremely low. Can you speak louder? near a microphone or something. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Okay, so I wasn't able to connect.
connect last time because of my phone. No, no. Now your sound disappeared suddenly. It came and it went. Try again. What about now? Can you see me? It's very low. Wait, let me check something. You did something right. It suddenly was good. Worst case, chat. Yeah. What about now? Is it good? I can barely hear you, but let's go give your question. Let's see what happens. Sure. Uh, my question was. Go. Good. Okay. My question was regarding like, um, what is the one suggestion you want to give us students to be a successful engineer? Okay. Good question. Quantify all critical values and qualities. And there is a book on this I can make available for you. It's called Quantier. And uh, Manuel, rem if, uh, remind me, but uh, I will give a link to a free copy of Quantier, which is a book on how to quantify all qualities and values. Mm -hmm. okay. Remind me, I'll give it to you. Uh, so, uh, Anton had a question or a hand up at least. A couple of people in the queues. Yeah, Anton is the next. Yes. Good morning. Uh, oh, good afternoon. Sorry. Hi, yeah. Anton. So, it's a very well known fact that there is no universal recipe like for every problem. So, when the incremental approach doesn't work, in your opinion, or yeah. it works forever. Oh, uh, are you asking me if there is a situation where incremental approach is not the correct problem solving technique. Yes, that's correct. Thank and you. the answer is yes, of course. So it's simp extremely simple short term urgent problems would be in that class. Okay, okay here, uh, let's say you have to make a decision to um, enforce vaccination of the entire Russian population with Sputnik uh, uh, in the coming uh, month. And, and the health department has to make that decision. <laughs> uh, you have not got time for any incremental learning. You're either going to do that or not do that. And, and you know that if you don't do that, it, the, the um, virus will explode and it gets worse. And if you do that, uh, if you do it, a lot of people are going to be very angry because you force them to take a vaccination. You know? But it, there, is no, uh, there is no space in such decision making for incremental learning. Okay, so uh, I think it's a very good answer for the short term, uh, but what about long term? So, okay, in terms in of. The, okay. Uh, in general, everything long term will always require incremental learning. And the reason is the world is complex and changing in millions of unpredictable ways. And there, you have to respond to the reality, to the COVID virus that Donald Trump said was under control because only one case in U.S. You know, <laughs> I mean, you, 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 he ha even Trump had to respond. So uh, 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 now there may be exceptions, but let's just say 99.99999% pr probability long-term requires incremental methods. Okay. And the one exception, I don't know about it, but I won't claim it doesn't exist. Okay, thank you very much. By the way, if I were God, and I'm not, maybe I would know about the exception. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's see. I don't see any other hand here. So I think, I think we can wrap it up. Good, then I get lunch. <laughs> seconds, but I don't, uh, sometimes there is some last minute question that uh, it's oh, yeah. appearing only when- I, I, I want to ask one question I didn't figure out. What is yeah. the driving and flying time from Moscow to Innopolis? Uh, to Innopolis, uh, you fly to Kazan. So it's about one hour, one hour, one hour 10 minutes. And then, uh, 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 then another hour by car. <laughs> so, okay, I <laughs> so wondered about that. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It's about like this. Okay, so, uh, you you fly probably to Moscow first. You, you to come here also. 
there is Istanbul. Istanbul as an option. Pretty yeah. good. Because yeah. you fly directly Istanbul Kazan. You don't, okay. don't need to, to Moscow. Good. That's what I needed to know. I just was curious. I couldn't quite place it, but okay. Inopolis is 40 kilometers from the city of Kazan, but the only transportation is a bus or a car. Yeah. So this is why yeah, it well, is. This is like moving about little Norway. We have the same thing, an hour flight and car and yeah. Okay, I got the, I understand geography. So that was also very last chance for last question. Yeah, because usually, you know, when you say that you are closing the connection, there is always someone. Last Alexander, <laughs> bingo. Alexander, you are. Oh, no, but this is a clap. This is a clap. It's not a question, you see? Yeah. It's clapping. That's virtual oh, applause. Clapping. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thanks and for the lecture. Do a real one. Okay, thank you. Uh, pleasure. I hope I have uh, changed your intellectual lives a little bit, incrementally. Definitely, very, very exactly incremental. This is de definitely very good seeds, very good seeds to 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 think and uh, and to to work further on it. Good. Okay, thank I'll be you, seeing you, you on, uh, on the internet and uh, another lecture another time. We will try to organize it once one another one next semester. Good, I'm with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Do